Good morning, everybody. Before we get started today, I wanted to take a quick second. First of all, to everybody who's out in the lounges. I know you see me on TV right now. We're starting in the plenary. We welcome you to come in here. Thank you for coming so early. We have so much programming over these two days. I wanted to take a quick second, uh, especially for anybody who's here for the first time, uh, to let you know that Concordia is actually a lot more than just this event. Uh, we do programs all year long. We have initiatives in Latin America, in Africa, and Europe. And you might have noticed all, all over the venue here different logos of our members, our partners, and our sponsors. The only reason we're able to do any of this, to bring this many amazing people together, is because we work with so many amazing organizations and companies that are dedicated to making the world a better place and doing it in a sustainable way. So if you don't know much about Concordia, there's a help desk in the lobby. There are tons of staff from Concordia all here. And I encourage you to actually take a second and speak with them to learn more about what we do and how we can engage all year and not just during this insane week of the UN General Assembly here in New York. With that, I would love to welcome all of you to day two of the 2019 Concordia Annual Summit. We keep on running, running through a red light like we Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage our moderator, Alex Cummings, and our esteemed panel. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Alex Cummings, and I'm joined this morning by very three accomplished and distinguished panelists. Uh, we only have 20 minutes for this topic, uh, and so we'll quickly introduce ourselves and, and get right into the, the subject matter. So, we'll, Kristen, would you mind introducing yourself very quickly? Kristen Lord, President and CEO of the Global Education and Eng Education and Development NGO, IREX. Rachel Delon, um, President and CEO for our Global Growth Organization for General Electric. And Andre Kalanzopoulos, Chief Executive Officer of Philip Morris International. So to kick us off, uh, I'm going to ask Christine to do two things. One is very quick summary of a survey, uh, IREX, her organization in Brooklyn uh, just completed, talking about P3s, public-private partnerships. It's actually titled Global Development Disrupted and also to share some of experiences around partnerships, challenges, opportunities, and that will set the basis for the rest of our conversation. Great, thank you so much, Alex. Good morning, everyone. Uh, a few months ago, my colleague George Ingram and I from the Brookings Institution published this report. It's called Global Development Disrupted. We surveyed 93 leaders across the global development sector, private sector, public sector, nonprofit sector, impact investors, foundations. We asked them, how do you see the global development landscape changing? How is your own organization uh, adapting? And it's a really very, very rich report that covers a lot of ground. You can find it online. Again, it's global development disrupted. Uh, but what I wanted to talk about today is what we heard about partnerships. And everybody in our sector, we all agree, the problems we're dealing with are just too complex to deal with effectively on our own. We need to have partners. We need to have a rich array of different kinds of partners. But here, everybody agrees on this. There's no dispute whatsoever. But here's one of the things that came out when we did these one-on-one -on -one surveys. Partnership is really hard. Nonprofits confessed to us all the challenges of partnering with the private sector and enumerated the different challenges. And then we were also very surprised that the private sector leaders told us, we really have trouble finding the right partners. And of course, all the nonprofits who read it said, call me. Uh, but uh, we found this very, very interesting. And so I wanted to point that out. And I also wanted to give you, from my own perspective, running a global development organization, just a few tips we've learned at IRAX about how private sector organizations might smooth the path of partnership, both for them and for uh, the nonprofit partners they're working with. Uh, so I'll just give you three tips. Uh, the first tip is you may need to think about growing your partners, especially if you're working with local organizations in country. They may have 
wildly talented staff, they may be closest to the work, but you may be well advised up front to make some investment in their capacity, their leadership development, their uh, measurement and evaluation, their organizational capacity, and you usually find it's better to think about this at the beginning rather than two or three years in when you're realizing that you overtaxed them. Uh, so that's point number one. Point number two is, I just love that old adage, professionals talk logistics, amateurs talk strategy. Um, and what we often find in partnerships is that the press release looks great, everybody is so excited about it, but then the things that trip up partnerships don't have anything to do with the subject matter or the partners themselves, they have to do with logistics. Things like budget timelines, people going on parental leave, people who were the champions leaving the organization, and thinking those things through from the beginning will really, really help. And then the last thing I wanted to say is that we at IREX, we participate in literally hundreds of partnerships with different kinds of actors every year, and partnerships need to be managed. Uh, you know, it, it, we like to think that everyone will just play their part and these things will just magically come together, but a lot of partnerships these days are hugely complex. They have a lot of different working parts, and unless somebody is specifically tasked with making the partnership work, making sure people are doing what they need to do, and uh, pulling all the pieces together, we just find that they're not as successful. So I'll leave it at that and see if my colleagues have anything to add. Sure, thanks for that, Kristen. So uh, Rachel and Andre, do any of these findings or tips resonate? Uh, any examples of how this has impacted you and how important are partnerships to the success of your business? And start with GE. I think it's totally resonates on uh, the points that you made. Um, so I think for the people in the audience, the GE, we are in the infrastructure business in energy, in aviation, and in healthcare. So in today's world, infrastructure is cross-border. Uh, it's go beyond one company and it's all go beyond one country. Um, so really, I think in today's backdrop, um, it has a lot of complexity that entails risk in geopolitics, um, in operation, and also in financial. So to really make a infrastructure project work, it requires really partnership for country between country policy coordination, um, and also capacity collaboration. And then to a lot of extent, there's also capital markets integration. Um, so I'll give you one example. We recently uh, closed a financial project for the second largest wind farm in Kenya. The developer is local in Kenya. Uh, financing is from US. Uh, GE, as an American company, we're, we are the OEM um, solution provider, technology provider, but the EPC is Chinese. So just to make that project work, you require actually different parties um, come together. And it's not easy, and that project alone we did the financial closing uh, last year, uh, second half of last year, but it's really a six, seven years undertaking, and a lot of things are happening in the given country in the course of six, seven years. So I think our learning here is to make really partnership work. Um, there are a couple of in important ingredients. Uh, first of all, you really have to commit to an outcome, and this outcome uh, is not just in the point of acquisition of the project. You really have to take a long-term view um, and then take into consideration for us is the life cycle of the project. So there will be quantifiable return on investment business case you have to put together up front um, to convince the shareholders and businesses to do it or not to do it. But you also have to take a looking at the cost over the lifetime of the project whether it's being service costs, or whether it's the cost or potential cost of environmental impact, and also can it create jobs for the local to bring sustainable growth for the company instead of just doing a project at one time, but over the course of the life cycle. So I think that is uh, very important upfront as you are lining up the different partners uh, committed um, to a outcomes. And I think the second point here is all the parties has to have a long-term view and a broader band, a bandwidth of tolerance of managing through volatility and uncertainties. Uh, it's just today's world, you know, that we're living in, and you can read the headlines. I think uh, I've never seen a, a period where the speed and scale and intensity of all these changes are happening uh, like today's world. So what do you do? You rely on the teams and you rely on the expertise. So for us, the key thing for today's infrastructure project is really who can bring the uh, capacity of resources and financing on the supply side and matching that to the demand. 
So I'll give you an example. Um, there is over a billion population in today's world that does not have access to reliable power. So there's no shortage of demand. But these are not uh, automatically turning into bankable project. It does require different expertise. In GE, we are the OEMs and technology and service provider, but we can do everything. So however, we are in a fortunate position where we can um, we, we are a technology provider. We have really the in-depth, broad portfolio. But in the meantime, we operate in 180 plus countries where we are local. So as we're managing through this volatility and uncertainty, building a local capability on the ground, team has really market domain and bring partners have um, expertise in areas, let's say EPC or financing capital markets that we don't have but around the world where we have access to, and bring them together and match the needs. I think that's the key. And you're going to have to manage it through the volatility as we go along. And I think, I think last but not least is you have to maintain a certain sense of optimism. Um, the optimism meaning if, if, if you just look at today's headline, if we are, it can be very easily uh, to be pessimistic. Um, but I think the, you know, it, there's going to be issues come along. Um, but I think through the dialogues, um, through the uh, with the common commitment on the goals, um, as we work through it toward that goal, I think um, the optimism is very critical. Great, thanks. Thanks, Rachel. Andre, same, same question. These teams resonate. Yeah. Examples. I mean, first of all, we are a very a highly regulated industry, as, I, as you imagine, cigarettes, and we're transforming the company to move away from cigarettes into smoky products that are less harmful for one billion people. Now, these transformations don't happen very easily because it's across your supply chain and across your own company. Uh, to give you an example, and the first principle that is not widely accepted in public, private sector partnerships is the very principle sometimes of governments to work with the public sector, to work with the private sector because from ideology to whatever reason, uh, it's very difficult to establish that very first relationship. Uh, the second thing clearly, and I would use an example that is very true, uh, we work with hundreds of thousands of farmers worldwide. All these new products use less tobacco. So over time, there will be less, and you need to help the farmers change. For that, a farmer that produces a crop like tobacco, it's not a publicly traded commodity, so you buy directly. They are no price fluctuations, so they're very used to have a very stable income. All of a sudden, you want to help them convert into other crops. The farmer wants to have certainty that at least four or five first years He's going to sell what you ask him to produce. They have no experience in this product. Alone, you cannot do it. I cannot buy soybeans. I so you need absolutely to find partnerships with other companies and local non-government organizations that help this transformation. You can put the money. You can put the effort. You have to be local, to your point. You cannot do it. We work with countries like Malawi for years. If you are not having presence there and make things happen, they don't happen. Okay? Well, it takes time. So the, the question is how you create the forum in which, as you said, companies find each other and a common interest. Um, and it's not easy. It's not yet, in my view, orchestrated, even under the United Nations. Uh, maybe there is too much need of control from governments and from the United Nations of the process of the UN uh, Sustainable Goals. And I think the effort has been made to create this forum. We participate, I mean, there is the World Council for Sustainable Development, for example, that tries to create these forums. I'm sure there are other forums. Um, and it has to be common interest. So we are trying to work with food companies, in my specific example, with others. Um, and you need to dedicate absolutely parts of your organization in doing this. Mm -hmm. It's a day-to-day -day work. As we all know, ventures, partnerships take time. 
but I will come back to you know, a little bit the bigger picture here that we're discussing before. Uh, you know, we talk about climate change quite a lot. There are many other challenges and stressors on the human system, from acidification and plastification of the oceans to the soils becoming less and less productive over time because we use fertilizers and so on. And fundamentally, regulation, because typically everybody says we need more regulation. Yes, more regulation can give it incentives for people to innovate. You have a carrot and stick strategy. But at the end of the day, it's about convincing people around the world to behave differently. I mean, even in our case, trying to convince people who smoke and don't quit to switch to less probably harmful products that give them the same satisfaction, it's a very difficult thing to do. Convincing people to use solar panels for energy rather than the easiness of turning on the electricity, in theory, is better, but it's not easy. So you need to explain to people constantly, consumers, what the problem is you try to resolve. Give them alternatives. We cannot just say we're going to change the world without bringing from the private sector new solutions to the problems. Otherwise, people tell you, OK, I got it. I have a problem. But what am I going to do about this? And then give them incentives. They can be fiscal. They can be regulatory. And hope that this will happen. And just by expecting governments to do something only is not going to happen. I think we all agree. We need to have the private sector. We need to have NGOs or other organizations working together. But the forums, and I think here is a good place, the forums must be established, and that should be the effort. Right. So are you sensing um, an increasing willingness from NGOs and of governments uh, to, to partner? And what one or two things you'd like them to know as the private sector that would, that would help enable uh, better, stronger partnerships? Uh, Rachel? Well, I think ultimately, if the goal or the public and private sector, the goal are the same to driving sustainable growth, I think there can be common ground to be found. In our experience, the intercept of where technology, capacity planning, and skill sets training all come together, that will bring sustainable progress for the society. So I give you one example. Uh, we, uh, several years ago, I think four or five years ago, we did a joint venture in uh, Saudi together with Saudi Aramco and Tata. And essentially set up a back office processing center. Um, I think the joint venture hired 1,000 fresh college graduates, all women. And this is a huge deal in the country. Um, so, but think about that's aligned up with what the Saudi government wants to do in their vision and their transformation of the economy and diverse, driving the diversity of the workforce and what GE brings. And we, there's a business needs in terms of building the scales of back house processing centers in that region. Um, in the meantime, uh, it does require a lot of uh, training because these are fresh college graduates. It is completely new to them to do the back office processing, whether it's being HR, financing, or sourcing. So extensive process, extensive skill sets training. But I think the business model thrive. And today, that is a um, center that is, you have really skill sets workforce, and then providing services not just to GE and the region, um, to um, Saudi Aramco, but also to the other businesses in the region. I think it's a clear win-win situation. So I think you gotta find the tools in that intersector where technology, capacity planning, and also skill sets training that come together. And this is an area where I probably disagree a little bit. You do need a logistics, which is action, but I also think you need strategy. So I think you gotta have both to make it happen. Right. And Andre, same question, are you sensing a more willingness to partnerships around the world? or And what would you like yeah. partners to know? I would say it depends on their own government organization. I mean, if we look at history, clearly NGOs have played a role in creating public awareness about product impacts, externalities companies create. We've been criticized, and rightly so, 
as an industry. Uh, but at a certain stage, in order to change, you need to change attitude. Just criticizing companies, oil, tobacco, whatever, is not going to make consumers change behavior. It's very difficult. It may help governments create the right regulatory environments, and I think that's fine. So I think turning into a more collaborative way, because at the end of the day, we care about changing consumer behavior and not ticking the box and getting funds, that would be a right change. Obviously, NGOs and governments don't have the means to execute, but if you do it together with companies that are willing to do it, and genuinely, I think we can be much more successful in you know, getting the right changes in the environment, in the regulations, in whatever, that convinces people to move. Yeah. I think that, personally, if somebody goes against an oil company because of the climate change, it's not going to convince me to go down the well of the village and take water in my bathtub, rather than have a wonderful motor that brings it up to my bathtub. We, I need solutions, and I need to be convinced and incentivized to do that. So we need both. We need the awareness creation, yep. and at the same time, the collaborative way to have the action down to the consumer. I, I would, if I may just jump on one point there, I think the key thing for this partnership to work is everybody has to recognize what they bring on the table and right. what are the Great. gaps that they don't bring on the table. It worked for private sector, but also for public. We see clearly progress in places like Kenya, and we see that in China, for sure. Um, but it's not happening everywhere, but I think it's going to take time. Great. F very quickly, Christian. Flip the question, what would you like businesses to know as a, somebody from the uh, NGOs world, if you will? What key messages, what would help from a, your perspective for businesses to understand to make partnerships work? Yeah, I think one thing I'd like to say is to really sit down with us and talk from the beginning about the problem you're trying to solve. Uh, I would say that when we've had our most successful partnerships, we have started with the problem and not with uh, the, the private sector partner has already decided exactly what it would like to do. So for instance, uh, at IREX, we're working on a really exciting partnership with Walmart on preventing uh, human trafficking and promoting safe migration. And actually working on the prevention side of trafficking and, and promotion of safe migration and supply chains is a really important issue for them and for other companies. And by starting with that problem, we sat down together and we co-designed a really exciting program across two countries. It's going extremely well. We think it's very innovative. But if either one of us had come to the table with a prescription already in mind, I don't think we would have had the same level of innovation. Great, that's correct. So I, I think if I were to summarize very quickly in no particular order, problem definition is very important. Everybody knows what you're trying to solve. Uh, understanding what everybody brings to the party, the complementary skills and acknowledgement of that. Uh, third, trying to find a win-win, get rid of the suspicions. Uh, I also heard you say manage the partnerships, if you will, very important that you do that. And Rachel mentioned localizing the management of the project. So uh, we've run out of time. Uh, I want to thank, again, our very distinguished panelists. Thank you for your engagement. And uh, P3 is important, uh, important to solving the many complex problems we have around the world. So thank you all very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Please welcome to the stage N2N24 U.S. News Director Gustav Allegret and our esteemed panel. Thank you everyone for coming. Um, I know that for many of you, Venezuela and the Venezuelan topic is something that is personal. It's affecting the whole region. It's uh, worrisome. Um, we have been a political, humanitarian, economical crisis. And I think we have the best voices to talk about that. 
So I'm glad to introduce our fantastic panel today, this morning. To my uh, left, uh, Carlos Becchio, who is considered the ambassador of the government of Juan Guaido in Washington. Lilian Tintori is uh, an activist, is uh, a, a prominent Venezuelan voice uh, of uh, human rights defenses, and uh, is also, let me say that, the wife of Leopoldo Lopez, who is a political prisoner and uh, an activist also in Venezuela. And also, um, I'm glad to have in the panel uh, David Smolansky, the chair of the working group on Venezuelan migration and refugee of the uh, Organization of American State. Thank you for uh, being here today. And uh, in this panel, we should have um, also Juan Guaido, who is the uh, interim president of <coughs> Venezuela for more than 50 countries around the world. Um, he's not going to be with us today, but uh, let's listen to uh, a small video that he sent specifically for this event. Please. Hello to the international community that is present at Concordia, composed of politicians and civil society. To all you, a brotherly embrace and an appreciation for providing us the opportunity to communicate. We need to take advantage of this moment to share with you as the National Assembly, the legitimate institution in Venezuela. Today, despite the threats and persecution for the dictator, of the dictatorship, we have resisted and held our ground with the help of our people and the institution and the constitution as the presidency in charge. Today, we can say firmly that we can count on the acknowledgement of an unprecedented 57 countries, and we continue to take on more support each day. Today, Venezuela needs more support from the international community to dismantle a criminal regime that, was, that has subdued the population into poverty hunger, violence, emigration, not seen before, bringing a state of vulnerability to our people, of which many have become refugees. However, we understand that we must rebuild the country, firstly, with emer emergency humanitarian aid, increase in petrol production, improvements in basic services, and safety, among other things. Today, Nicolás Maduro is a threat to the region, not just Venezuelans who are already affected, but for the region in whole. What is happening in Venezuela today not only affects Venezuelans, it affects the whole world, while Nicolás Maduro continues of usurping power, the region and the world will have a dormant threat, and that is evident in, its re in his recent actions because of the support and the welcoming of two ex-leaders of the FARC who have established a dissonance and relapsed into armed conflict to infringe upon the stability of the region. Without a doubt, the earlier we reestablish democracy in Venezuela, the whole continent will benefit. We are living through a dictatorship that threatens, imprisons, and murders. Today, I am the president in the office in this context. However, my commitment is full with the Venezuelan people despite the risks to stop the takeover and achieve a transition in truly free elections and transparency that permits the people to choose a path, not without destination. Only in a dictatorship is an election given a surname. Remember, despite the fact that he will not be in New York, the whole delegation of the government will try to confound. On our end, we will send to New York an important group of Venezuelans that will represent the legitimate government, not just to speak the crisis in Venezuela that Venezuelans are suffering, but to tend to the solutions as well to come together and alleviate the flow of migrants and humanitarian emergency, but overall to help rebuild Venezuela so we can return to normal and the 4.2 million Venezuelans that have emigrated can return and be able to contribute to the support of our region and recuperate the petrol industry, which is a benefit for the world. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Let us permit that this crisis in Venezuela not become the new norm. And on the contrary, let us address and find solutions together on our behalf so we can push forward. the voice of the considered president, interim president of Venezuela. At the end of his remarks, he mentioned we need to find solutions. <coughs> I think we are clear that uh, how deep, how serious is the crisis in Venezuela. Let's focus on solutions. Ambassador, solutions. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, 
Good evening, uh, good, uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you for this invitation, Gustavo. It's a pleasure being here. I want to thank Concordia. Matthew, thank you very much for what you have done and for supporting our cause. It has been very important to have this uh, scenario to uh, explain what's going on in Venezuela. The first things that we need to say is that if we want to resolve the humanitarian crisis, we need to attack the root of this problem. And this, we need to understand that this is a man-made disaster. This crisis has been created by Maduro. So if we want to attend the humanitarian crisis, if we want to stop what's going on in Venezuela, we need to change the regime. We need to bring democracy back. So this is not about Maduro. This is not about Guaido. This is about the people of Venezuela. We need to stop the suffering of the Venezuelans. And the only way to resolve this crisis the flows of the people across the region is just bringing a democracy back and just stopping the dictatorship uh, in Venezuela. Today, Nicolás Maduro, the regime of Nicolás Maduro, represents a threat against the region. As Interim President Juan Guaidó said, it's not a threat against Venezuelans. It's a threat against the region. And it's important to mention that yesterday, yesterday was activated the Rio Treaty, 60 countries in the region voted to activate that mechanism to protect the peace in the region. So today, the most important countries in the region considered that Maduro is a threat that has to be defeated in order to keep prosperity and progress in our country. So this will be the most important things for me uh, to keep in mind, that we need to change the regime, we need to increase the pressure internally, domestically, under the leadership of Juan Guaidó, and of course, internationally. And that's what we are doing right here in this uh, event. Thanks. Thank you, Ambassador. Lillian. Well, it's very hard and, and long fight in Venezuela, because you know, thank you for being here today. Thank you, everyone, because I know all of you are very impressed and worried about Venezuela about the Venezuelan people, and that's why we are here. We are here from, from the women, from our children, for the families that suffer the humanitarian crisis, the deep humanitarian crisis, the worlds in our history. And I think, of course, Carlos Vecchio, our ambassador, yes, we need to stop the regime, we need to stop the dictatorship, and we're gonna change our country, and we're gonna rescue Venezuela. But I want to ask something here, and I, and I feel that's gonna help us a lot. I can't believe countries don't recognize today, ones of, one of, uh, of countries don't recognize yet Juan Guaido. And that ask is very important here in this week, here in the UN, we need all the support for our president, who is our legitimate president, Juan Guaido. And that's gonna help for for the, for the stop, sorry, for the power, and that's gonna stop the dictatorship, and with all the pressure of the sanctions and the, and the TR, of course, but we can do this. We can, we can stop the dictatorship as a legally um, a transition, and that's why I think that's gonna help stop this humanitarian crisis. Thank you, Lillian. Um, uh, David, uh, in your responsibility, you have to deal with the humanitarian crisis. Um, more than four million Venezuelan refugees are right now floating in the region, particularly in uh, Colombia, but in other countries. Um, tell us a little bit uh, more about uh, what are the uh, challenges that the, those refugees are facing today and how this migration wave is affecting the region. Thank you, Gustavo. Thank you, Concordia, for, for having us. And it's impossible to mention Matthew because uh, you've been, you have had Venezuela as a priority for this. So thank you so much. Uh, yesterday, 5,000 Venezuelans fled the country. And by the time that we're going to finish this session, 200 Venezuelans would have fled the country. 4.3 million Venezuelan migrants and refugees is the largest displaced uh, population in the world with no war and no natural catastrophe. And if we include the population with war and natural catastrophe, we are the second largest displaced population in the world just behind Syria. Just to give you a perspective, 
4.3 million Venezuelan migrants and refugees is more than the population of countries like Panama, Uruguay, Croatia, Qatar, and Kuwait. This, has, has, this is the largest ever in Latin America and the Caribbean. And as Ambassador Vecchio said, it has happened by a man-made disaster, by, human, by the human rights violation, generalized violence, the collapse of the economy, the collapse of the, of the public service, and uh, of course, the lack of food and lack of medicine. So I have visited the region 15 times in the last year, meeting with so many Venezuelan migrants and refugees. And of course, the main challenges are providing food, providing healthcare, and especially their, document, their, their documentation to be regular in the countries. And I want to give some good news to, to you, even though this is a very hard a, a challenge for Venezuelans. Um, the vaccination card is something that is going to start in October. One million cards is going to be provided in the region so Venezuelans could have a better healthcare attention. And at the same time, the countries, the receiving countries will uh, share the data so that will it, that will represent a better use of the, of the, of the budget for this. And also, um, countries like Colombia are doing a huge effort to regularize uh, Venezuelans or giving permission to work. But to, we have to be very clear here. The only, I have to be crystal clear here, the only solution to decrease migration and refugee flow in Venezuela or outside Venezuela is to restore democracy and freedom. The longer the dictatorship takes, the more people we're going to see flee. The faster we restore democracy and freedom in Venezuela, the less people are going to flee, and, the more, and a lot of people are going back. Mm -hmm. Well, many points, and uh, a little more than 10 minutes uh, to finish. Ambassador Vecchio, um, why the dialogue process, the last attempt, because I have many, mean, uh, many um, uh, the last of them was also uh, a failure. I mean, it's an opportunity for the regime to gain time. Is the regime committed to the dialogue or it's just a theater? Yeah, we need to be very clear with, uh, with the international community. Uh, as you know, we are looking uh, uh, to restore democracy in Venezuela. We need to stop the suffering of the Venezuelans. And interim President Juan Guaidó knew that you know, going through that process of negotiation with Norway, it was a, a, a difficult one because we know the regime. They are not willing to, 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 to leave the power, so we need to force them. But he wanted to explore any, any option in order to facilitate that process inside of Venezuela, or to facilitate the process in Venezuela. And he went to that process. Uh, and we presented a solution, a political solution to facilitate the transition in our country. Actually, he presented there sort of a, a state council, like a Estado, Consejo de Estado, to create a national it's, unity. It's regulated in the Constitution. It's in the Constitution. He presented that uh, uh, on that table uh, uh, to have a, a unity government, a national unity government to conduct the transition under the condition that Maduro should be out of power and as well interim President Juan Guaido. So it was a, a clear act of good faith because we understand what we are facing right now. We need to bring you know, solutions on the table. And we presented that. Well, Nicolas Maduro, decided to abandon that process because he's not willing to leave the power. He was manipulating inside that dialogue or that negotiation. And we need to blame Nicolas Maduro for the failure of that. And also, we need to understand that today, Nicolas Maduro is the obstacle for peace. And that's why we are asking to the international community to increase that pressure. As Lillian said, we need to expand the coalition. We have received a lot of support. We need more. We need more countries supporting Juan Guaido. We need more countries, not only uh, the United States, Canada, and Latin America. We need from Europe as well the support if we want to bring you know, democracy back. And this is the right time to do it. I don't have any doubt that if we get you know, strong support from now on, we will conquer freedom again. The majority of the people of Venezuela, they are looking for a change. The spirit of hope is there. Mm -hmm. And if we keep that determination internally, if we preserve the democratic society, as we are doing right now, if we preserve the, the leadership of Juan Guaido and get the support of the international community, this year, Venezuela will be free again. Related to the dialogue, I would like to hear also from Lillian and David. David. Well, um, it's, uh, it's difficult to deal with uh, organized crime. Uh, 
the Venezuela is a unique case in the world, in my opinion. Uh, this is not a conventional dictatorship, a classic dictatorship that we have had in Latin, in Latin America in the past. We're talking about a criminal state. Imagine Pablo Escobar running Colombia or Chapo Guzman running Mexico. That's what's going on in Venezuela at the moment with external support of countries like Russia, Cuba, and Turkey. Uh, Jos Maduro announced that in the next hours he will be flying to Moscow. So what's going on in Venezuela is not only affecting Venezuelans, it's affecting the region. And that is why uh, it's so important to restore democracy and freedom in Venezuela, because that will not only benefit Venezuelans, but all, also will benefit the region. I always say, Gustavo, um, at, the, at my office at the Organization of American State, that we have the vision of the friendly hand and the strong arm. The friendly hand is to attend and protect all the Venezuelan migrants and refugees from here in the United States, there are more than 400,000. To Colombia, there are 1.6 million. To Peru, there are 900,000. But the strong arm is to keep the pressure on the dictatorship until we restore democracy and freedom, and people will be able to go back and raise their family again. Thank you. Um, Lillian, you have lived uh, in Venezuela uh, recently. Yeah, I, I, need to, I want to add something about the dialogue. OK, briefly. You can dialogue with somebody that have the key of your cell, jail. Right now, we have more than 500 political prisoners in Venezuela. And they want to talk with, with uh, taking our prisoners inside jails and torture them. They torture them. So as Felipe Gonzalez, President Felipe Gonzalez said always, the reason of a country that is in dictatorship is see if they are prisoners of conscience. See if in that country are political prisoners. And in Venezuela, we have more than 500. So first, release all the political prisoners, respect human rights, respect the law, respect people. Because Nicolás Maduro is, is a dictatorship, but he's a criminal dictatorship. He, he knows and he, and he, and he never said, yes, we are in a humanitarian crisis. No, he denied the, the crisis, but he blocked the medicine and blocked the food and blocked the economic process and blocked our, all our dreams of the opposition. Um, I, I was thinking uh, to ask you about uh, what's the general sense of the Venezuelan society. In 2014, we saw huge demonstrations. Actually, if I'm not mistaken, was in one of those demonstrations where uh, Leopoldo Lopez was detained. And since then, he has been a political prisoner. Um, why, why we cannot see such huge demonstrations nowadays? I mean, are the Venezuelan people throwing the towel because they are so desperate uh, to look for other basic needs that they don't have time to go to the streets? I mean, what's, what's the, the sense of the Venezuelan people? No, al contrario. I, I was okay. talking by phone this morning with Leopoldo, and it's very exciting to be here with our ambassador and David Smolansky, because I remember in 2014 when Leopoldo Lopez, my husband, denounced Maduro and said, it's a dictatorship, it's a repressor, it's inefficient, and it's a corrupt. And Leopoldo, uh, go to jail for five years, now Leopoldo is free. Leopoldo is in an embassy, working for freedom and working with all uh, government of Juan Guaidó to, to get it, get it free and, and have all the, 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 the momentum to, to, para lograrlo. O sea, to achieve it. Lograrlo. We have to achieve it. Lograrlo porque está en las almas it de cada venezolano. Because it's in the arms of every Venezuelan. And it's in the arms of the international community. And the arms that we haven't lograrlo. used, we have to use them to achieve it. Pero but now the people in, in, in Venezuela, I think we are, have more compromise. You know? Not only for uh, Juan Guaidó, our president, who is our leader, is with progress and is with, with Yes, we want food and we want medicine. And one example of this is in 2014, in 2015, and 2016, we start asking for food and medicine around the world. And we go around the world asking for food and medicine. So we enter the food and medicine, remember, David, in box, and grupos irregulares, paramilitares. Groups, paramilitary groups. They keep knocking us, they keep knocking doctors, they take doctors to, who receive the box of medicines, and we leave all this. Right now, Rescue Venezuela, our foundation, we are the capacity to have 
humanitarian camps in each state of our country. And the people who help us to do this is people around the state and is the irregular groups, the paramilitaries as well. So everybody wants a change and everybody wants help. And, it, and, it, and everybody in Venezuela, inside Venezuela, militaries as well. Militaries around Maduro wants democracy and wants freedom. And it seems that the United States you know, uh, Gustavo, has very clear. I, I was about to ask you uh, particularly about the US policy with Venezuela. We saw um, assistant um, uh, for national security, uh, uh, assistant national security advisor John Bolton exiting the White House. And so many people thought, okay, now the policy with Venezuela is gonna change, it's gonna be smoother, it's gonna be soft. Uh, have you perceived this change in the, no, in the no, policy? Not at all, not at all. I mean, we are willing to work with any uh, uh, person appointed by uh, President Trump. I would say that President Trump has expressed you know, a strong solidarity with us. He um, has become one of the most important ally on this fight. And you can see you know, different people, but same policy. And he was so clear, you know, and he sent that message. They will keep uh, the policy against the Maduro regime until we conquer freedom. So there is no any doubt. And it, it, it is not only words, it's actions. So you have seen you know, sanctions, uh, putting indictments, uh, and also not only the pressure, uh, but the, um, uh, the solidarity with the people of Venezuela. They have granted more than 300 million uh, to support uh, the people of Venezuela, inside of Venezuela, outside of Venezuela. They have sent the comfort ship, which is a hospital vessel that they have sent twice to the region in order to support the refugees that you know across the region. But let me just add something from the previous question that you made. I have the towel in the hand. All Venezuelans, all Venezuelans, they have the towels in the hand. And we will keep that until we conquer freedom again, okay? So imagine 2018, the beginning of 2000, uh, the end of 2018, December, or the beginning of January, could you think that we would be in this position right now? After you know, a couple of months, I would say that now we have an interim president of Venezuela with the majority, with the support of the, of the Venezuelans. More than 80% of the Venezuelans are supporting Juan Guaidó and looking for that change. That is there. Also, we have ambassadors in different countries, more than 34 countries, and we have created the most important coalitions after World War II. Mm -hmm. In other times, in other circumstances, but this is a very strong coalition. We have now protected the assets of the Venezuela who are located abroad in order to put them on the service of the people of Venezuela when we recover uh, the full control of the government. So we are now in a better position. And Maduro is weaker than before. Maduro is not governing Venezuela. Maduro is surviving in power. He's not able to resolve any problem inside of Venezuela. And the inner circle of Maduro knows that. So again, we don't have any other alternative. We need to prevail, and we need to defeat the dictatorship, and we need to conquer freedom again. And I think we have in the right time to produce that change. Okay. Um, <laughs> briefly, yes. and I have very, one last question. <laughs> just just a, a reflection to end. How desperate has to be someone to walk from Cúcuta to Lima? Just to give you an example, that's the same thing if you walk from New York to Los Angeles or San Francisco. That's what Venezuelans are doing right now, walking the same distance from New York to San Francisco. How desperate has to be a woman to walk all those kilometers to give birth somewhere in South America? How desperate has to be a young student to take a boat and risk his life to get to Aruba, to Curaçao, to Trinidad, to Tobago, and to any Caribbean island? The biggest lesson from Venezuela is that if you lose democracy and you lose freedom, you can have the same consequences uh, as uh, having a war. So don't take freedom for granted, don't take democracy for granted, and help Venezuela to restore democracy and freedom because that will benefit the region and the world. Okay. To you, you have a very supportive audience, as you can see. <laughs> okay, I have to finish, but uh, I am a strong believer that um, Everyone uh, should uh, learn and be better if we are capable to introspect ourselves and identify why could have done better. 
And many people believe that the opposition could have done better. Um, can you, each of you, tell me one thing that the opposition could have done in another way, in a different way, uh, and you have learned from that mistake in order to address the political, economic, and humanitarian crisis in, in Venezuela? And I'm going to start with Lillian. Uh, we, th we think and we always work together. And so unity. Yes, with unity, always, because we need all body. And, and we always gonna be open to uh, sumar y sumar y sumar so gente, add, add gente, add gente, people, gente. people and people and more people. And uh, one example of the unity that we have today uh, is our National Assembly <clears throat> from 2015. And right now our president, Juan Guaidó, who is the leader of all the opposition in Venezuela. And the world is very clear who is the clear opposition and who is with Maduro. So if you are with Maduro, you are the same of Maduro. David, 20 seconds. Well, I think it's, it, I, I think it's very important to understand that we are in a geopolitical conflict that there's not only the interest of Maduro to, to stay in power, there is an interest of <coughs> external allies, as the one I mentioned before, Cuba, Russia, Turkey, and, and others, even China as well. There are also interests from the illicit economy with the groups that run drug trafficking, illegal mining, smugglings, and irregular groups. With a country with the largest oil reserve, the eighth largest gas reserve, and the 12th largest gold reserve. So this is not something small. And that is why uh, not only we need to understand more that internally, that's one of the things that I have learned more in, in my exile in these two years and listening in the region all the time, but it's important also, important also to, to understand it internally. And that is why I always say that by the time the dictatorship falls in Venezuela, it will be a huge celebration in all over the world. You know, I would say, Gustavo, that uh, I think we were not in the same page in, in the real nature of this regime. We need to understand that we are facing not a failed state, we are facing a criminal organization who is in power. These guys, they are being involved in drug trafficking, money laundering, terrorist uh, activities, um, you know, abuses of human rights, uh, and, and, and we need to understand that, that we are facing a criminal organization. So if we understand that clearly, it will be you know, easier for us to take the, the, the actions that we need to take in order to defeat them. But also, this crisis has become more complex, and I think not everybody shared this, due to the presence of Cubans and Russians in the side of Venezuela who are supporting, I, I won't say Maduro, they are sub supporting the suffering of the people. Mm -hmm. And we need to reject that. And the world and the international community who respect democracy and human rights must condemn you know, those countries who are supporting the suffering of the Venezuelans. The voices of uh, Carlos Vecchio, ambassador to the United States of the Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela, Lian Tintori, Venezuelan humanitarian rights activist, and David Smolansky, who is the chair of the Working Group on Venezuelan Migration and Refugee Crisis of the Organization of American States. Thank you. Thank we you. are with you. Thanks. Thank you. Please welcome to the stage Dana Bolden, Senior Vice President of External Affairs and Chief Sustainability Officer at Cortiva AgriScience. Maybe I don't go out anymore. Feeling like I really don't deserve this. I feel nothing like it was before. Cause all I wanna do is just hold somebody, but no one ever wants to get to know who's like. Good morning. I'm pleased to be here today representing the 20,000 women and men of Corteva, Corteva AgriScience. Corteva is America's newest ag input company. We're less than a month away from International Rural Women's Day, October 15th. And I wanted to share just a few thoughts on the crucial role that women play in agriculture. When you sit down at night, think about this. There are 7.7 .7 billion people in the world today who are wondering where their next meal is going to come from. In the next 30 years, that number is going to increase by 2.5 billion people. To put that in perspective, that's like adding India and China together 
to our world in the next 30 years. As daunting as those statistics are, the good news is that we have the acumen, we have the technology to close the gap. But we have one real challenge, and that's closing the gap between women and men in agriculture. To better understand this gap, last year Corteva launched a study of 3,000 rural women farmers around the world in 17 countries to understand what the disparities were, the differences were between them and men in agriculture. And not surprisingly, half of those people surveyed, those women surveyed, said that they were denied the same access to capital, the same access to technology, and the same access to land as their male counterparts. There's a real desire for training among women farmers, particularly in the countries of Brazil, Nigeria, Kenya, Mexico, and South Africa. Those are the countries where women cite the highest need for training. As I mentioned, we're America's newest ag company, and to make our mark in this space, we decided that this was an area that we were going to tackle, not alone, but together. And so we launched what we call the Women's Leadership Academy, in conjunction with the Brazilian Agribusiness Council and the Don Cabral Foundation in Brazil, where we teach women critical business skills, leadership skills, agronomy skills, teach them how to do financing, not only to access financing, but to do microfinancing amongst themselves. And rather than talk about what that work looks like, I wanted to share just a very quick one minute video about the outputs of that academy that we've created. Please roll the tape. agro no Brasil daqui 10, 20 anos, eu acredito que não vai ter mais esse questionamento. Não vai buscar mais, vem essa mulher, a mulher já vai estar inserida nele. A Academia de Liderança fez com que eu entendesse que a mulher, às vezes, ela precisa estar apoiada em outra, precisa estar apoiada em um grupo para poder ir para frente. I invite you to visit Corteva.com to learn more about this academy and the others that we have around the world. But as, you know, as Fernanda said in the video, I look forward to a day when we're not talking about putting women in ag agricultural leadership roles. I look for the day when women are already in agricultural leadership roles. You know, the stakes are high, but so are the opportunities. And we need the support of business, governments, and civil society to help close this gap. It's going to require that level of collaboration. And if you want to learn more about the stories of women in agriculture, we have a partnership with the Inter-American Council or Cooperation on Agriculture, ICA, AICA. And I think there are representatives of AICA here. We've jointly published this book called Warriors. Google it, go on Amazon, find it. It comes out on October 15th to coincide with the launch of International Rural Women's Day. It's a powerful book, powerful stories, and I ask you to take the opportunity to look it up. Ensuring women's place in agriculture for us is not a choice. We can't feed the world in the next 30 years without women being leaders in agriculture. This is not a societal issue. It's not an economic issue. It's an issue of pure survival. Making sure that women have roles and leaderships is incredibly important to feeding our hungry planet as we move forward. Thank you for your time.
abakazi kuti rukuri mabyo kurya ibyo kujya bigasira makabitu abana baboneye school fees abasize abalima batarafo kwerera abana bikumire ba abakazi kuba ari kubahika uko abakazi kuba ari kwija baba yisenjo ngazabo zamaka Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage President and CEO of CARE, Michelle Nunn, and our esteemed panel. So it's wonderful to be here today with you. I'm Michelle Nunn, I'm the CEO of CARE, and uh, we are a development humanitarian organization that does work in 95 different countries. We started uh, post-World War II Europe with the creation of the CARE package, and so we were addressing hunger at its uh, at, at the root of our organization, and over time, we have evolved. We now do uh, long-term development, but also continued emergency assistance. And what we've, uh, what we've evolved towards continues, and it continues actually today, and it's gonna be a part of the conversation that we're gonna talk about, is um, how have, have we and must we all evolve to meet uh, the extraordinary challenges that face us around food, nutrition, security. And so today, we're gonna to talk about food systems. Uh, and just to give everybody a leveling, when we talk about food systems here, for purposes of today, we're gonna to talk about how food travels from field to fork. Uh, growing, harvesting, packaging, processing, transforming, marketing, uh, consuming, and disposing of food. So you all know uh, the many challenges that face our food systems today, just a few uh, reminders, over 800 million people are chronically hungry, and that's on the rise. Uh, malnutrition is responsible for almost half of all the deaths for children under age five, uh, and developing countries are increasingly facing the double burden of both undernutrition and also uh, the rise of obesity. So we also know that roughly a third of our food is actually wasted, and we know the incredible threats that climate change brings. So we know that we have to create some changes. And the current reality of our broken food systems is um, born from inequality. And what we're gonna focus on today is uh, particularly the inequality of women and how that affects our food systems. So we know also that women play an extraordinarily important role in food production and yet, they're often the ones that eat last, are most, poorly, uh, are most poorly nourished, and they struggle for the basic equality around things like uh, land titles and uh, credit and insurance. And so we're gonna talk today about um, the incredible challenges that we face. And we're gonna focus a little bit on Care She Feeds the World, a program that has been uh, putting girls and women at the center in order to ensure that small-scale farmers can realize productive livelihoods and profits in their work. So She Feeds the World, which you saw a little bit about here, is focused on a very ambitious goal. 50 million people, smallholder farmers, women, that are transformed in their capacity to contribute uh, in, uh, in the next few years, by 2022. Uh, we know that um, we must enhance the resilience of the vulnerable and small-scale farmers and especially focused on women. So we have the chance to highlight that today and we have an extraordinary panel to do that. Uh, so I wanna start by first of all thanking uh, PepsiCo and Cargill both for making it possible for us to have this gathering and also for their extraordinary investment in the She Feeds the World program. I think we could not have a better panel than the, the extraordinary four women that we have gathered here today. You all have their bios. I'm just going to, uh, to, to introduce them briefly to you, and then we're going to go into uh, a, what we hope will be a rich conversation. So Christine Dougherty is the Vice President for Global Sustainable Agriculture and Responsible Sourcing at PepsiCo. Ruth Kimmelshu is the Senior Vice President for Business Operations and Supply Chain, and she's the Chief Sustainability Officer at Cargill. 
Kathleen McLaughlin is the Executive Vice President and Chief Sustainability Officer at Walmart, and she's also the president of the Walmart Foundation. And Mar Margarita Astrolaga is the Director of the Environment, Climate, Gender, and Social Inclusion Division at the International Fund for Agricultural Development, which is a long way of having to introduce <laughs> yourself, I'm sure. <laughs> um, so I'm going to start with Christine, and uh, we've talked about the importance of women and girls and gender equality, and it's at the heart of this initiative that we're working on together called She Feeds the World. So can you just talk about why PepsiCo is prioritizing this and uh, what's brought you to that realization of the importance? Yes, thank you, Michelle, and uh, thank you everyone on the panel and the audience. Um, at PepsiCo, uh, we're super excited to partner with CARE. Um, if you didn't know, uh, agriculture is at the heart of PepsiCo. PepsiCo sources over 25 key commodities in over 60 countries. And we know that women are an integral part of that agricultural supply chain. And as uh, Michelle said, women make up nearly half and they spend more than 18 hours a day likely in the fields. And so time poverty and access to seed, access to proper training and nutrition are a key focus for PepsiCo. So through our foundation, we've pledged over $18 million to help meet that gender inequality. And so for us, it really is a business case because we know if we can lift those women up out of the agricultural supply chain, give them the resources that the male counterparts have, access to quality seed, training, even access to land, it's likely that they will outproduce the men 20 to 30 percent, and that can be 150 addition, million additional mouths to feed. So for us, um, it's just great business sense. So we're super excited to partner and engage um, with CARE on this journey. One of the things that's exciting about this relationship is you all have committed to 5 million smallholder farmers, but more than that, you've said, we want you to realize the whole 50 million, and we want you to partner, and we're going to invest in enabling those partnerships. Uh, so, um, Ruth, we want to talk a little bit. You all are at the center of the supply chain. Um, talk to us a little bit about what you see as the critical needs, priorities for smallholder farmers today. So, thank you, Michelle. Um, it's great to be here. Uh, for those of you who may not know, um, Cargill is a 154-year-old private company based in Minnesota, doing business in 74 countries around the world. Um, and for about a third of those 154 years, about 50 years, we've had a really vital and vibrant relationship with CARE. Um, we believe uh, that we have an opportunity to be the leader in nourishing the world in a safe, responsible, and sustainable way. Agriculture is a very, very critical part of that as we think about the extent of the food supply chain. There are three areas that are critical um, for women to be able to access as it relates to continuing to develop and enable women in agriculture. The first area is to ensure that they have access to financing. The second area is to ensure that they have access to markets. And the third area is to ensure that they have access to technology and approaches that allow them to be as productive as possible and to be productive in the most sustainable way possible. And so Cargill looks forward to continuing to partner with CARE in those efforts. And perhaps one of the best ways to give you an example of what this can look like in reality is to tell a little story. And the story is about a farmer in the Ivory Coast. Her name is Christina. And when Christina was a little girl, um, she used to fo follow her father around the cocoa fields. And, um, she loved to be with him as he was farming cocoa on their small uh, plots of land. Unfortunately, when Christina was young, her mother passed away. And so her father decided that he needed to send Christina away for an education and to teach her something that would be useful for a woman, and so he sent her away to learn sewing. <laughs> Christina returned to the village with a new found sense of confidence and I think an idea that was perhaps different from that of her father. And she went to her father and she said, Dad, can you give me a piece of land? I want to farm. Today, Christina is 64 years old. She is one of the most productive female farmers in the Ivory Coast. Mm. 
And through her efforts in her community, she's working with a co-op that Cargill supports in the Ivory Coast to help other farmers um, to employ more productive ag practices, to understand uh, and develop more financial acumen and access to financial um, resources. Um, and she provides, most importantly, an example for other women of what success in this space can look like. And it's those kinds of partnerships, those kinds of stories that we look forward to seeing more of in the future because that really is how we can continue to change the world. It's a beautiful story. And, and I think it also puts uh, literally one woman in the center, which is often so important for us to realize in the, in the broad numbers that we talk about. So Kathleen, um, uh, Walmart, um, can you tell us a little bit about, and maybe drill down on this question of smallholder farmers and how Walmart is making a difference at the ground level uh, for them? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, we believe that the best way we can make a difference to communities in terms of agricultural development, uh, as one example, is through our business. Uh, and we also use philanthropy. And what we're trying to do is um, essentially accelerate transformation of supply chains so that we can make them sustainable from a social perspective, environmental perspective, and economic perspective. Uh, and what's exciting is I think you're seeing more and more companies recognize that the best way to strengthen their businesses is to strengthen the systems that we rely on and we have particular assets as companies that we can bring to bear in development. Um, so there's a, a lot of um, synergy there. So just one example, we've, we've been working for quite a while in um, different supply chains around the world to try to accelerate sustainability. Um, one example is in India, where we recently made a commitment both to source a quarter of our produce for our cash and carry business from very local smallholder farmers um, close to our stores, and then also to invest $25 million in philanthropy to strengthen farmer producer organizations and um, support smallholder farmers. So I was just there a couple of weeks ago meeting with some of the women farmers. So about a third of the women that we're um, supporting ultimately through, through our grantees are women. So we'll reach about 81,000 with the grants that we've made so far. Um, in Uttar Pradesh, Andhra Pradesh, Telangana. And so what we're focused on is a couple of things. So one is improving the agricultural practices, so adoption of much more sustainable natural methods. Um, second is introducing new crops to create more resilience and um, have better access to markets. So for example, some of the farmers we were meeting with were uh, making mushrooms, or, or, or sorry, growing um, tomatoes and, uh, and groundnuts and they've introduced mushrooms and okra. So it extends their selling season uh, and also uh, you know, obviously increases the income. Um, they're incorporating quality assurance practices that allow them to have uh, certifications around things like mint, so in Uttar Pradesh, um, growing mint, and that's gonna really enhance the value of what they're selling. Um, and then most importantly, getting access to markets. So, broadening the buyers that they have exposure to, teaching them negotiations and, and so on, and putting women on the boards of the FPOs. So um, we're excited about that program, and uh, it's an interesting example of how as a business we can use both our sourcing as a form of development capital, but then come alongside with philanthropy and broaden the societal impact of what we're trying to do uh, through the supply chain. I think it's so exciting to see that complementary pairing of the philanthropic and the business imperatives. And mm -hmm. you know, in, in, when I think about Cargill, for instance, a relationship 50 years ago started with their donating to some of their customers. Um, well, instead of sending holiday cards, they sent care packages. So, you know, a, a true philanthropic donation. And now we have this very integrated business-oriented. Uh, partnership and holistic and so Margarita I want to ask you to talk about we've each one of the panelists I think has really spoken to the variety of integrated holistic approaches that they're taking can you speak a little bit to EFAD and the work that you all are doing in an integrated way and how that's coming together thanks Michelle well um, first I would like to start by saying that um, I'm Colombian and my father was an agriculture engineer Mm. who studied in Ames, Iowa. Mm. And uh, when I finished high school, I wanted to be an agriculture engineer. And my dad said, so if you want to be an agriculture engineer, be ready to teach. 
That's the only thing you can do as a female agriculture engineer. Hmm. So thank God the world has changed so much. <laughs> yes. And I'm proud of being part of this process of changing the lives of women at all levels uh, in, on the ground in Africa, in Latin America, in Asia and the Pacific. So in IFAD, um, what we are trying to do is to ensure that we are taking into account all the um, social and environmental and climate issues together in an integrated manner. Because as it was said before, uh, it's women that have to work very hard to get water. It's women that have to go and work and find the wood to cook. Uh, it's climate change that is exacerbating these issues. There is no water, there is no energy, there are no trees to cook. So the idea was to ensure that we are integrating women and girls, uh, climate change, youth, nutrition, in one sort of uh, approach, one single approach. So our board has committed that uh, we spend about one to uh, 1.2 billion dollars a year in a smallholder farming uh, with environment and climate focus. So that's at least 900. Uh, in total, 900 million in in um, in three years. But every year, 1.2, 1.3 billion have to look into issues related to climate and environment then at least 100% of those, so almost all of it, should look into women empowerment. Mm -hmm. But we have moved from women empowerment, initially it was just 50% of the beneficiaries should be women, but we discovered that it's not enough mm -hmm. because of what was said before. They have no access to land, they don't have access to finance, mm -hmm. uh, they don't have access to seeds, to inputs. So now we have moved into making sure that we are transforming their lives. And doing that is very difficult because you have to change the mindset mm. to make uh, them themselves understand and value themselves yeah. that they can make, that they can do it, that they can be independent. So we are trying to change these mindsets partly through uh, our work at the household level. Mm -hmm. Sometimes when we talk about nutrition, we think if we educate women, that will be enough. What we have discovered in Africa is that sometimes it's men deciding the menu. It's not women. Mm -hmm. Therefore, we have to work at the household level with men and women and try to demonstrate to them what are the power schemes within the household. Because these power schemes within the household are, you can see them at all levels then. It's household, it's the local, it's the regional, and then the national level. Women are powerless, and they themselves don't feel they have a right to a voice. Though, so that's part of that effort that we are uh, having. So 50% of our investments should be nutrition focus as well. And 50% should aim at looking at the youth and bringing the youth on board. So we are trying to have 50% of our beneficiaries should be youth one way or another. And uh, getting nutrition in is a bit more difficult. We have talked a lot about food systems and the importance of nutrition. But uh, maybe we can discuss a little bit that later because the problem with nutrition is that it's seen as a responsibility of ministries of health. Yeah. And it's not always linked with agriculture. And there we have a huge challenge. Yeah to ensure that it's really nutritious food, enough food, but not calorie intake. It's yeah. not just a lot of cassava and corn, which I love, yeah, of course. <laughs> but <laughs> it's not just that to help us deal with the nutritious, yeah. Yeah. nutrition issues. Well, I think um, you, did, you did a really eloquent job of talking about the complexity of this and the multifaceted ways in which we have to invest, and also the entrenched uh, social norms that are a part of this. I mean, Christine, I want to one, no, and ask you, um, ha, in terms of making the business case for investing in uh, smallholder women farmers, has it been difficult? Are there obstacles within the company itself around that? Uh, it's a journey, absolutely. Have you heard us all? Um, if it was easy, we wouldn't be up here on the stage today. <laughs> um, but I, I would say it's absolutely a business case. Um, I want to give you an example of one of our farmers in, in Thailand. Um, in many areas in Thailand, they irrigate the crops through flood irrigation. 
And so these women and men spend eight, nine, ten hours a day making little dams to move the water around. Well, we were able to work with um, one particular female farmer, uh, Ms. Bao, and bring in a pump that was powered by solar panels. She was then able to move away from flood to drip irrigation. Productivity increased. Hmm. Quality of the crops increased. Time poverty, which uh, many of us were seeing heads nod. Time poverty is massive. The amount of time women spend doing the multitude of tasks. By allowing her to not spend eight hours making little canals, she was able to then get better quality seed, make a business plan for her farmer or for her farm, and an ambassador for the community. So, so yes, absolutely, there's an immense business case to bring up productivity and quality, but that farmer to farmer, peer to peer learning is really how we're going to make this succeed. So we have such a short period of time to cover such a big topic. So I'm going to show how efficient women are by asking <laughs> you all to, uh, to limit the next questions that I have to one minute. Um, so I'm going to ask Ruth to tell us uh, the power of partnership. We've been partnering for 50 years. Why it's so important, the one minute version. Okay. On your mark, get set, go. Um, so as, as has already been said, if this were easy, it already would have been done. And the opportunity is to say, how do we bring um, various stakeholders together to really create a significant impact? And some of the power of partnership comes in the results that we see on the ground. We know that as we lift up women, we also lift up communities. As we improve um, standards of living and provide access to women and girls, um, the whole entire community thrives. We provide access to food, we provide access to nutrition, we provide access to water, all of the things that are so basic in enabling um, people to be successful and to achieve more than the generations before them have done. And so um, it's critical that we continue to allow and support the um, strengthening of communities so that um, we can see a more sustainable future and so that we can address issues related to poverty and hunger around the world. And even though Cargill operates in 74 different countries around the world, we're not everywhere and we're not interacting um, with everyone. And so it's through the partnerships that we're able to magnify and amplify uh, our presence and also to support the presence of those various partners. Yeah. Well done, thank you. Um, Kathleen, can you tell us in one minute or less how you're driving change through your supply chain? <laughs> wow. wow. Um, yeah, so we uh, imagine a grid of every commodity that we sell. Produce, meat, seafood, apparel, toys, you name it. And then issues, so climate, waste, women, yeah. livelihoods, chemicals, food safety, um, forced labor. So on that grid, it's a heat map. And we focus intensely either on columns or rows or sometimes a single cell if, you know, seafood forced labor is one. And so in each of those, we're trying to accelerate change in the way the system works. How does the supply chain work? And we're using multiple assets. So relationships with suppliers, technology, policy, investments through philanthropy, if it's an issue that's quite systemic and goes beyond just a Walmart supply chain. Um, so we bring those assets to bear in combination to accelerate change all the way from production of that commodity to transport to the use and end of life, trying to make a, a circular economy in each, of those, in each of those cases. I'll give you one example, climate change. We made a commitment, I think we were the first retailer to set a science-based target for emissions reduction in our own business, but also the supply chain, where of course most of the emissions lie. And so we created a platform called Project Gigaton. We need to take out a gigaton of emissions between now and 2025 um, through this platform. So we're working in um, energy efficiency and renewable energy, waste, packaging, sustainable agriculture, deforestation initiatives, and product design. And so we've asked our suppliers to sign up and make their own smart goals, commitments in those areas and then we're working with about a dozen conservation organizations, everyone from CDP to World Wildlife Fund to CI, TNC, EDF, you know, all those folks who each bring different skills to bear, different practices, different tools, and we're sharing with suppliers how to make progress in those areas. 
We now have over 1,100 suppliers signed up, and we reported in our ESG report a few months ago that we're already at 93 million metric tons emissions avoided toward the billion goal. So we're right on track. That's how we do it. So we try to drive through the supply chain and use business as an accelerator of social change. And what you said is so right. It's social, environmental, economic. We have to solve for equilibrium across those simultaneously, or it's not sustainable. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. I think only a McK former McKinsey consultant could do that. And, uh, <laughs> so um, Margarita, could you tell us uh, the one minute, because I'm going to ask each of you to say one word about what, uh, hope, what you're hopeful about at the end. So we'll do that quickly. But Margarita, if you, could, if you could help us understand the broader financing picture. We're talking about the private sector here, but there's a much bigger picture. Can you elaborate? Yes, I think uh, in agriculture, we obviously have the multilaterals playing an important role. We have also the public expenditure from the domestic uh, government decisions, but also the private sector for us is key. Because when we look at, for example, investment on climate, we see that the largest investor really is the private sector. Because all, all of us gain from having adaptive agriculture. If not, there is no produce that we can generate. Therefore, uh, blending finance, de-risking investments for the private sector and ensuring that we have the common uh, ground on legislation and policies to ensure that everybody investing in agriculture in sustainable, inclusive agriculture has the same benefits or the same fines and punishments for not doing it properly is key of, for the work we want to do in attracting more finance for what we want to achieve. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, terrific. So maybe we'll end on a hopeful note, because this is a big, complicated topic. And I think we all need uh, to believe that there's something that we can take action on or something that we can be hopeful for. So can you each, just in a few sentences, say either what you're hopeful for or uh, one action that you think that we should be collectively endeavoring to take on? Absolutely. I, I'm hopeful for driving impact. Uh, making sure the efforts that all of us are, are doing are making an impact um, on the ground. And so that's what I'm hopeful for. Yep. I am hopeful and excited about bringing the voice of farmers, and especially women farmers, to the conversation. Um, I think the more that we listen, the more we will learn, mm -hmm. and the more that will enhance our ability to actually have an impact uh, and to drive change. And, uh, and so contrary to a lot of the conversations that we hear today or a lot of the um, concerns that are expressed, I'm actually very hopeful and optimistic about the power of agriculture to not only transform itself to produce more sustainable food for the world, but also the power of agriculture to transform communities and to raise people up. Wonderful. Uh, I'd say two things. One is the convergence um, between environmental and social factors and economic factors and the recognition of business um, to uh, incorporate ESG considerations into their financial decisions. So that's one. I think more and more you're going to see companies do the kinds of things that these companies are doing um, to drive that uh, progress on environmental, social, and economic uh, market outcomes. And two, technology. That's the only thing that lets me sleep at night, actually, is what I see happening with technology that's helping us accelerate improvements, whether it's climate or waste or agriculture, you name it. Um, that gives me hope. We just need to go a lot faster in implementing solutions. Final word. Uh, I'm hopeful that uh, the 52% uh, rural women in the world that don't know how to read and write, in the next 10 years, they will do so. Mm. And the second thing is that we would be able to mend the broken sustainable food systems. Mm. As you said, from the field to the fort, yeah. we all together have to work to get there. So that's a beautiful way for us to close out our session and I think an invitation to this audience to join with us. Uh, we know that if we ensure gender equality in agriculture, that um, that, that is a huge part of mending the broken system. And so thank you. We have an extraordinary panel. And I can tell you that um, I think this panel is uniquely uh, demonstrative of the efficiency and effectiveness and strength and power of women. So give them a hand.
Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage Concordia co-founder and chairman of the board, Nicholas Logothetis, Dr. Mary Margaret Frank, academic director at the Darden Institute for Business and Society at the University of Virginia, and Keith Cratch, undersecretary for economic growth, energy, and the environment at the U.S. Department of State. Good morning, everyone. Welcome back to uh, day two of Concordia from all of us. Um, this is uh, a session that we're extremely proud of and, and thrilled that you're here to join us uh, for this morning. So Concordia, the US Department of State's Office of Global Partnerships, and the University of Virginia's Darden School of Business Institute for Business and Society are once again humbled by all of the applicants of this year's P3 Impact Award, which recognizes leading public-private partnerships around the world. This award was born from aligned interests across, across all sectors, nonprofit, government, and business, and an ardent desire to better understand the growth of partnerships and the factors that influence success. Our mutual desire to understand the role of P3s in addressing complex global societal issues highlight best practices and shared learnings, as well as honor organizations leading the way, has brought us here today, celebrating our sixth iteration of the P3 Impact Award. To date, we've received hundreds of applications from all over the world, leveraging partnerships to address challenges in their local communities and countries. Each year, our staff are blown away by the applications we receive. They represent partnerships that truly highlight cross-sector collaboration at its best, ones that improve communities in most impactful ways, fostering a more productive utilization of resources by respecting and leveraging differences. Public and private sector collaboration embodied by partnerships like the ones we are celebrating here today facilitates innovation, impact on scale, that can bring economic security, peace, and prosperity to all nations. From embracing market-based solutions in agriculture in order to elevate farmers from the poverty in Southeast Asia and Africa, to enhancing access to reliable, affordable, and effective healthcare in the Caribbean, this year's finalists are driving the solutions that will create a more secure and stable global ecosystem. By using collaborative models and leveraging the strengths of public, private, and civil society partners, the finalists are ensuring the impact they are having today will continue to be sustainable and scalable for the next generation of leaders and innovators. They highlight the value of trust, transparency, and accountability in facilitating cross-sector partnerships that develop and deliver global solutions to some of our toughest problems. These are truly outstanding examples of best practices for working together across sectors to achieve these goals. Congratulations to all the finalists here today, and thank you for your positive impact you have had around the world. Our five finalists are I've got the first one, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Get ready. <laughs> Care2 Communities and the government of Haiti have come together to form the partnership to deliver quality, sustainable, primary health care in Haiti, which has adopted a market-based approach to improve access to and quality of community-based health care healthcare clinics across all of Haiti. The value chain for rural development partnership between Rinrock International, USAID, Amaria, the Coffee Quality Initiative, Coffee Atlas, and Behind the Leaf Coffee links ethnically diverse communities of small farm holders in, my, in Myanmar, excuse me, to better paying domestic and global specialty coffee markets to improve agriculture productivity and incomes, spurring inclusive economic growth in a country once isolated from the world and the global marketplace. 
All right, number three. <laughs> Numero tres. <laughs> Conservemos de la Vida is a collaboration between the World Wildlife Fund, Fiduciosen, Grupo Agos Fiduciosen, Smurfit, Capa, Colombia, National Central Parks of Colombia, Incorporation, Autonomo, Regional del Valle del Cauca, that has adopted a localized approach, working with rural farmers to, protect, to protect the Andean brown bear from extinction. Fourth, <laughs> Bioko Island Malaria Elimination Program is a partnership that combines long-term financial commitments from Equatorial Guinea's Ministry of Health and Social Welfare with expert assistance from MCDI and if IFACARA in the nonprofit community, corporate partners of Marathon Oil, Noble Energy, and, and Atlantic Methanol Production Company, Scenaria to represent the biomedical community, and Swiss TBH as part of the academic community. Talk about getting everybody. Together, they have developed a malaria elimination method methodology that has not only reduced malaria prevalence by 75%, but has also created a model for malaria-affected regions across Sub-Saharan Africa. And finally, the Commodity Alliance Forum and Value Chain Development Program, with partners at IFAD and Olam, address systematic market distortions in Nigeria to support smallholder rice farmers on the path to profitability and reliable livelihoods. It has been another great year of applications and even stronger finalists. Each year, the P3 Impact Award process informs the partnering community about how different stakeholders are collectively working together through internal and external channel, channels towards achieving an aligned goal. We, and I personally, learn so much through this process, and we use our work together strengthening, strengthening the Parco ecosystem so that innovation across the world can be shared with like-minded stakeholders around the world. I want to extend my appreciation and congratulations to all of those who have helped us today. Please join me in thanking our esteemed panel of judges for the 2019 Impact Award. Lisa Manley, George Serpog, Payel Dyla, excuse me, Megan Kashner, and Sarah Crawford. In addition to the prestigious P3 Impact Award, prestigious if we do say so ourselves, based on <laughs> careful evaluation of our judges, we also offer an Audience Choice Award. Yesterday, Concordia attendees met with representatives of each partnership and attended the final judging presentation. Afterwards, they had the opportunity to vote via the app for the partnership that they thought was most innovative towards addressing a challenge and achieving positive social impact. For the first time ever, our Audience Choice Award is also the same as our P3 Impact Award winner. The challenges facing our world are complex, and in some cases, entrenched. However, these partnerships demonstrate that advances in sustainable development, global health, or women's empowerment are possible when public and private sector actors come together to advance shared goals. The Department of State is proud to partner with Concordia and the great UVA Darden School of Business to present this year's P3 Impact Award to a team who is truly showing leadership and delivering results. Please welcome to the stage this year's P3 Impact Award winner. Let's start the drum roll. Let's get it going. Give me a drum roll. I need a drum roll. 
And the impact award winner is the Bioko Island Elimination Project. Let's give a round of applause. Come on up. Congratulations. 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 Thank you. Thanks very much. Congratulations. Let me give photo. Let me give each one of you guys. The photo? Here you go. Yeah. Oh, lost the photo opportunity. Okay. On behalf of the State Department, we are giving these great doers of good who are making a huge impact on the world, these transformative leaders, a challenge co coin from the State Department. Thank you again for your service. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Thank you, sir. All right, let's go up. You can go home. Yeah. You can go ahead. Yeah. Good, good morning, everyone. Uh, I am Mitoa Ondo Ayekawa, uh, Vice Minister of Health of Equatorial Guinea, which oversees the Bioko Island Malaria Elimination Project. And I'm Christopher Schwabe, the CEO and President of Medical Care Development, whose international division, MCDI, uh, is responsible for the management of the BMAP project. Also on stage uh, with us are corporate, our corporate partners, uh, Pat Sanders, who is the director of Marathon Oil's Equatorial Guinea uh, program, uh, representing the BMAP's uh, corporate partners here today, and Dr. Stephen Hoffman, who is the CEO and Chief Scientific Officer of Scenaria Incorporated, uh, the US-based biotechnical uh, company uh, working on part, as part of the BMAP team uh, to introduce their PFSPZ malaria vaccine to the efforts to eliminate malaria uh, from Bioko Island. We're also really pleased uh, today to have in the audience uh, representatives uh, from our other corporate partners, Noble Energy and Atlantic uh, Methanol Production Company, and our partners from the government of Equatorial Guinea, including the director of national content from the Ministry of Mines and Hydrocarbons, uh, and the director of the National Malaria Control Program uh, in the Ministry of Health, as well as distinguished members of Equatorial Guinea's delegation to the United Nations. And I, we would especially like uh, to recognize His Excellency Gabriel Obiang Lima, uh, the Minister of Mines and Hydrocarbon, who's not here today with us, but is uh, looking in on these events, uh, without whom uh, strategic vision, uh, this whole effort would not have been possible. We greatly accept the 2019 P3 Impact Award, as well as the 19 P3 Impact uh, Audience Choice Award, on behalf of our whole partnership, including our scientific and research partners at the Ifakara Health Institute of Tanzania, the Sweet Tropical and Public Health Institute, Texas A&M University, the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine, and the London School of Tropical Medicine, and most of our, our many dedicated staff within the BMEP and the Ministry of Health, and the numerous community of the Bioko Island with whom we engage on a daily basis in seeking to eliminate malaria. We wish to thank the US State Department, Concordia, and the University of Virginia for honoring BMEP and recognizing the work we do. This is truly an important honor. This unique long-term public-private partnership led by the government of Equatorial Guinea, has succeeded in bringing together the unique, complementary, and synergetic capabilities of each, par each partner to achieve sustainable health and economic impact at scale. Leveraging this highly successful public-private partnership, we believe that the Bioko experience could serve as the new paradigm for global health what we call PPP to the, to the power of two, i.e. public-private partnership that provide a scalable and sustainable framework through which projects become programs, become policy. We wish to extend particular thanks to His Excellency the President of Young of Equatorial Guinea for his vision and his continued support from the beginning. Thank you again to the U.S. State Department, 
Concordia, and the University of Virginia for this recognition, and we hope that by sharing this experience through this forum, that the BMEC will inspire further sustainable investment of this nature. Thank you. Kirita Johnson knows what it's like to have a child sick with malaria. On Bioko Island in Equatorial Guinea, nearly every mother does. In 2003, the malaria parasite infected more than 45% of residents. That's when U.S. energy companies joined the battle. They needed healthy workers to develop oil and gas fields near the island. We had a very aggressive plan to expand it so we'd have a business that will last for at least 20 or 40 years. And by doing that, we became the largest employer on the island. Malaria was clearly you know, the biggest challenge that we would face uh, as an employer, but also the community has been facing. With their money, long-term outlook, and data gathering skills, energy companies gave Bioko Island something else, hope. Spraying of homes saved lives. So did mosquito nets. Educational programs and community involvement also helped. But for every control measure, the malaria parasite and its mosquito carriers had a counterattack. Without a vaccine to interrupt transmission, malaria wasn't going away. Dr. Stephen Hoffman understands that better than anyone, and he knows the statistics. Malaria kills more than 400,000 people yearly worldwide. The level of malaria transmission on Bioko Island before the Bioko Island Malaria Control Project went into place was as high as it is anywhere in the world and much higher than most places in the world. That's the face of malaria to me when I look at those numbers. It's not just numbers. It's the children that I've seen who died of malaria that I couldn't do anything about. Hoffman founded Scenaria in 2003 to develop a malaria vaccine. Some experts scoffed at his ideas, but in 2007, a vaccine was ready for trial. Results fell far short of expectations. Funding evaporated. Hoffman was convinced the trial protocol, not the vaccine, was the problem. Now he needed funding and a place to conduct a new clinical study. He found both on Bioko Island. Added Hope came in 2012. The National Institutes of Health in the US showed Hoffman's vaccine was effective. But would it work in a malaria hotspot like Bioko Island? Testing in 2015 and 2016 showed the vaccine provided protection for at least 14 months. In this case, Equatorial Guinea has been seen as a country with a big opportunity. A big opportunity to help our own country and our population, yes, but also an opportunity to be able to help all of Africa. For mothers like Purita Johnson, it can't come soon enough. Please welcome to the stage Hassan Al Tawadi, Secretary General of FIFA World Cup Qatar 2022, and Ayman Mohadeen, journalist for NBC News. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for uh, joining us. Uh, it is a real honor and pleasure to be here with you guys. Uh, there is nothing like the power of sport in bringing the world together, and there are few events in the world that bring uh, the world together across so many cultures, countries, religions, divides, like the World Cup. We are very privileged to have with us uh, His Excellency Hassan Thawadi. He is the Secretary General for the Supreme Committee for the Delivery and Legacy. He's also uh, Chairman of uh, the FIFA World Cup in Qatar 2022, uh, and it is perhaps one of the most anticipated sporting events in our lifetime because it is the first time being held uh, in the Middle East, um, in the Muslim world, if you will. Absolutely. There is a lot at stake here, and I want to begin with that point by asking you about the transformative impact that you anticipate this World Cup to have, both on Qatar internally and on the world externally. No, absolutely. I mean, I mean, as you correctly pointed out, I think if you look, there, there's a lot of examples throughout history where major sporting events had tr transformational uh, impact on host nations. I mean, if we look at, for example, South Africa in 2010, the World Cup, you know, it came to the Rainbow Nation, but it wasn't one that was limited to South Africa. If you saw the, uh, the African nation uh, supporting Ghana, for example, when it qualified to the, to the quarterfinals, 
you could see that there was a galvanization of national pride and uh, continental pride behind it. If you look at the impact, for example, again, of, of uh, Germany in 2006, uh, aside from the fact that it had a transformational impact and a positive impact from a lot of people that we spoke to in terms of economic uh, 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 reformation, or at least economic activity, there was, to a large extent, a sense of healing between the uh, West and East German uh, uh, reunification that the World Cup in Germany actually brought together. And from every person that we've spoken to, you could see that, that, that you know, the one moment uh, that truly brought Germany together was the World Cup in Germany 2006. So there's many you know, different examples of, of the powerful impact that sports has. Now, in a region that is passionate about sports and yet completely misunderstood, in a region that has uh, a, a growing uh, younger generation coming into the workforce uh, that is severely misunderstood from the outside world, uh, and also in a region that looks towards uh, the need for, for, let's call it a brighter future, brighter opportunities, brighter options developed, there is no event today that is out there that, is, that has that potential, transformative potential, like the first World Cup in the Middle East in Qatar. And we're doing the best, you know, from day one when we bid in 2010, we always uh, committed to the fact that this was not a World Cup for Qatar. Mm. This was a World Cup for the Middle East, uh, by the Middle East. And we've been working very hard since then towards delivering the positive impact of this tournament beyond the borders of Qatar, and that's our measure of success. Let's uh, hone in a little bit on some of the potential changes internally within Qatar. You certainly talked a lot about how Qatar can change the perception, maybe some of the stereotypes that the world has of the region. How is Qatar, how is the, the Supreme Committee, how is the World Cup using this opportunity to push forward some changes internally within the region, within Qatar? Well, let's take it step by step. So, you know, we've kind of broken down, if you will, our legacy goals into more or less four different goals that correlate to the 2030 national vision of the country, which is economic diversification, uh, environmental sustainability, human development, and social development. And we've worked very hard towards ensuring that each one of these pillars uh, is fulfilled, or the World Cup acts as a catalyst to accelerate initiatives that will fulfill one of these pillars, both locally within Qatar and regionally. So when we're looking at, for example, you know, the, the, the first one is economic diversification. The country is committed towards ensuring that we create, uh, you know, we, we diversify from being a hydrocarbon industry. That meant looking at the sporting industry and the fact that today, if you look at Europe, if you look at the US, the sporting industry directly or indirectly contributes towards uh, the GDP, towards job creations and so on and innovation. And this is exactly what we're looking for the World Cup to do. So, you know, you're looking at the technologies that are being, the cooling technology that's being developed within the stadiums. Mm. This, is, this has an impact on out, outside activities, on, on manufacturing activities, and so on. So there's a lot of initiatives that are being undertaken over there. Uh, one of the initiatives that we've launched is an uh, initiative called Challenge 22. It's a regional initiative. We go out to the region uh, for young uh, startup companies. We offer them opportunities uh, to provide solutions to the World Cup uh, for, you know, for fan experience, for event experience. The winners uh, or the people that come on board, we provide them financial support, and we provide them the opportunity to be part of our procurement process, which hopefully then will lead that to being a platform that will launch them into uh, either a regional market or a global market. Uh, if you look at, for example, one of the elements that we're very proud of, where, it where we believe we've left a very positive impact uh, and a tangible impact is on the social side, which is in relation to worker welfare reforms. Now, the country before 2010 was committed to worker welfare reforms. Needless to say, however, you know, it wasn't to the extent that we were, uh, we were very proud of. I mean, there, there was a lot of issues that were out there. When the spotlight came, of course, and we always knew that the spotlight would serve as a catalyst to accelerating these reforms. Now, since then, the country, uh, through cooperation with international organizations, has made extensive progress when it comes to worker welfare reforms, when it, when it came to uh, uh, health and safety standards on, on, on the sites. Uh, but, of course, there's still more work to be done. Now, when you, when you look at the work that the Supreme Committee has done, and I know our organization sounds like a cult, but it's not. Um, you know, on worker welfare reforms, what we've done, for example, is, you know, one pr uh, element that we're very proud of is on the recruitment fee side. Um, you know, this is, a, this is a, a, an epidemic that I think a lot of migrant workers suffer from. Most migrant workers, when they leave their uh, countries, go to other countries, that criminal organizations usually blackmail them or force them to pay recruitment fees, illegal recruitment fees, uh, for them to be able to leave their country and go to another country and, and actually find, find a job and, and care for their families. Uh, 
one of the problems that we face and we've been talking to international organizations is how do you resolve the situation? Because the, the, the receiving countries uh, usually, you know, the burden of proof is usually on the, on the worker to prove that they paid these fees. Now, usually there's no paper trail for this. Mm -hmm. So what we did within the Supreme Committee is we actually flipped the burden of proof. We've coordinated and cooperated with a lot of uh, companies, major contractors, who've willingly joined into this program. And now the burden of proof is flipped on the other side. So if a worker claims that they paid uh, recruitment fees, these companies that have opted in, willingly opted in, would actually pay the recruitment fees to the worker, regardless of any proof, unless then they can prove that they didn't pay, which, which, which is, is an extent, it's a significant step uh, in, in the fight against these, these illegal practices. We're going to, I think by 2021, we're uh, set to contribute or re uh, reimburse around $20 million to workers, about 17,000 workers. Um, and half of these workers are not working on World Cup projects. Mm -hmm. I think it's important to point this out. A lot of the contractors that saw the success of this pro uh, program opted in and brought in workers not working on our sites into this program as well. So, I mean, this is kind of another example of where the World Cup has a knock-on effect beyond World Cup projects. So to that point, um, obviously when you host an event like this, both the country and the committee become under a tremendous amount of scrutiny. You've certainly addressed some of the, the, the criticism that has been levied against both the state and the World Cup in terms of its labor rights practices. And I just want to talk a little bit about that for a moment because as you mentioned, international human rights organizations have criticized uh, the pace of reform in some of these issues. Obviously, the systems that you talked about, whether it's the Kafala system and some of the other uh, issues. One, do, do you feel that the World Cup Committee has made enough strides to address some of these concerns or what more needs to be done? And two, give us the macro picture in terms of how the state of Qatar is doing on that front as well. I think to start off with, the simple answer is, you know, there's always more to be done. Um, when it comes to worker welfare reforms, I don't think any nation today can make the claim that they've done enough. There are nations that are very well advanced, no doubts, but I don't think any nation can make the claim that they've done enough when it comes to worker welfare reforms. Uh, there's no doubts that from our side, you know, we, as you said, you know, we've received uh, uh, criticism and, and you know, we welcome these criticisms, especially when it's con constructive criticism in relation whether it's to the pace or to the extent of reforms that are being done. But we've always, at least within the committee, I'll speak first on, on, on behalf of the committee and then I can, I'll can, i briefly touch upon the state's uh, aspects. Um, we've always said that you know, for these changes to be sustainable, for them to remain beyond the World Cup, to go beyond the time when the spotlight you know, uh, uh, moves away from us to another nation, it has to be done right. It has to be done with enough depth. It has to be done with enough, enough consideration to make sure it remains. And that was always our goal. Our goal was always to make sure that uh, you know, the, the beneficiaries are the workers themselves, and it is something that is done uh, in the right way. So there's, so obviously, from our side and within, within the committee, we've, we've, we've implemented worker welfare reforms to ensure that workers' uh, voices are heard. This is now being implemented by the state as well now. You've got uh, worker welfare forums uh, where, where uh, workers can raise their concern without any fear of retaliation or, or any concerns. Uh, we've implemented uh, medic help, you know, medical checkups, annual medical checkups mm -hmm. now to all the workers being you know, on our sites as well. We've implemented within the Supreme Committee a, uh, uh, we've implemented TPP-1 system, which is a uh, integrated electronic health medical checkup system that's being utilized within the AHS in, in, the, in the UK to kind of uh, unify and, uh, and centralize the medical records of all the workers. Um, to a lot, you know, we, we've, we, uh, to a lot, this might seem like, you know, it's, it's not enough, but it's significant steps from where we were. Right. And there's, of course, more work to be done. Now, when it comes to the state, I mean, I think the first thing is, you know, the kafala system, which got abolished, which I think is a very, a very significant step in the sense that it required legislative and social change as well to happen. And that today is successfully being implemented. Mm. Uh, minimum wage is being introduced. Uh, I know there's, there's discussions as to whether it's enough or not, but now it's being revised. It, you know, the first step was introduction of the minimum wage. Now the question is, how do you revise it and, and, and make it you know, to an extent that it's acceptable? And now this is being revised as well. Um, so, so like I said, steps are being made. Is it enough? Right. I will never claim that it's enough. And plan is simply, no, it isn't. There's more to be done. Let's talk about another important issue that has uh, kind of uh, captured the attention of the world, and that is the issue of climate change, the issue of sustainability. Uh, the World Cup being held in Qatar poses all kinds of challenges in terms of uh, air conditioning of the stadiums, the way the stadiums are being built. And I want to talk a little bit about the sustainability because we had millions of people protesting around the world recently, uh, demanding that governments and 
companies take climate change very seriously. Talk to us a little bit about what you guys are doing at the World Cup to try and align the World Cup with what is becoming an increasingly urgent need that everything we build brand new is sustainable in some capacity. Absolutely. This, comes, this takes us to the third pillar of the uh, national vision, which was environmental sustainability. It's something that the state of Qatar has been committed to for many years. Uh, when it comes to our World Cup, I think one, one, one element to point out, you know, we're a small country, so what we offered was a compact World Cup. The com concept of a compact World Cup is um, you have stadiums next to each other, you know, no more than an hour away. Now, the previous models of the, pre of the tournaments, if you look at, for example, Brazil, South Africa, and Russia in particular, it meant that co countries would be playing in one city, then they and their supporters would travel from that city in whatever mode of travel to a different city, and play another group stage over there, and then co constantly and continuously be traveling around. Now, obviously, that leaves a significant and extensive carbon footprint. In the World Cup in Qatar, that's eliminated. You, you know, just because of the compact nature of the World Cup, it means your carbon footprint, generally speaking, in terms of transportation, is reduced. Mm. That, that's that's one, for, uh, one element initially. Uh, the other aspect, of course, from our side is what we've offered is uh, we, uh, we've committed with uh, the uh, power producer in the country to develop a 100, mega, 100 mega, a megawatt so, uh, solar, uh, solar farm. Now, the concept of this is the solar farm will be feeding into the network. We're developing more and more initiatives that actually is reliant on solar energy that would feed into the network and would uh, balance out the carbon footprint that the tournament would leave. Now, our commitment overall is that this is the first carbon neutral uh, tournament. It's something that His Highness just recently uh, reiterated as well. And, uh, you know, again, uh, even if you look in terms of the way the construction and the operation of the, st of the stadiums is, it's reliant on uh, a system or a method uh, called GSAS. It's a, it's a standard of, of construction and operation that's been developed uh, in the region that, is look, that looks towards sporting facilities uh, in terms of sustainability within the sporting facilities. It's the same as LEED and the other, the other uh, construction standards, but it is more specifically focused on sporting uh, facilities that's now been utilized and, and, and been adopted by FIFA. Let me ask you, uh, it's hard, as you mentioned a little bit, when you talk about sports, to not talk about politics. The timing of the World Cup finds the GCC and the countries of the Gulf uh, divided. Uh, yeah. Qatar is uh, under a current uh, blockade from neighboring countries. Talk to us a little bit about how you envision the World Cup possibly being a gateway or a conduit to bringing the region together. I mean, I I is it possible between now and 2022, the World Cup, brings the GCC together? I think it's important to point out one thing. Leave aside the politics. Politically, yes, there are these, these issues, and you know, my country currently is suffering from an illegal blockade. But if you look at it from uh, a people's point of view, from the populace, uh, the region is together, and, and they are in support of the World Cup. Uh, to, you know, we've opened up, uh, in one example, we opened up a volunteering system, uh, a registration form, for people within the region. We have today, we've gone over the 200,000 mark for people from within the entire Arab world that have expressed an interest in being uh, volunteers. Mm. Now, out of these 200,000 people, you know, over, we've had about three events. We've got about over 2,000 people that have joined us from within the region. Uh, some of them have come from, blockaded, from the blockading states to participate as volunteers in the programs. The Challenge 22 initiative that I've mentioned uh, today, you know, a lot of them are coming from the region. Uh, a lot of people have participated from the region as well. The purpose of this tournament, and we've always made, been, made, you know, been very, very careful to ensure that we separate politics from sports, because sport really is a unifying uh, platform. And every element, every initiative that we've taken, every step that we've taken, has constantly reaffirmed and confirmed to us that the people are looking towards this event as a unifying event. Um, you know, one last example that I'd like to mention is when we launched our logo uh, a couple of weeks ago. We went to about eight or nine Arab nations. We projected the logo onto some of their uh, iconic buildings. And the support and the reaction from the people, again, I'm, I'm leaving aside ideologies, I'm leaving aside political differences, from the people was just, was just it, was, it was reinvigorating. And, and a significant portion of them came also from the blockading nations. So I think you know, it, it confirms again the vision that we've always taken as a nation. Sports is a platform to unify people. I think, you know, generally speaking, the nation always uh, committed to the fact that you, know, you resolve conflict through dialogue. Mm. And sports as a unifying platform, there's nothing more powerful than that. Let me get your final thoughts, if, if I can, on two issues before I get to the legacy. But I think a lot of folks here in the US in particular will be watching this and saying, what is Qatar doing to make sure that the World Cup is inclusive 
to all people from all walks of life, including members of the LGBT community who may have reservations and concerns about coming to the region uh, and participating or attending a World Cup? Look, we've said it from the very beginning. This is a World Cup and everybody's welcome. This is a football tournament, this is a sporting tournament, and everybody is welcome from all walks of life, whatever your ethnicity, whether, whatever uh, your, 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 your background, whatever your uh, uh, political affiliation as well, because I know the question of Israel seems to come up also quite a bit, and everybody's welcome. The whole purpose is this is an inclusive tournament. And the fact that it's, in the fir it's for the first time being held in an Arab, Middle Eastern, Islamic country is a great opportunity because the reality is we don't all necessarily, all of us share the same point of view or perspective in terms of ways of life. But that difference should not be a, a factor that separates us. It should be a factor that we can, all of us appreciate the differences between each other, appreciate that, they, you know, that, that there, there might be some differences in, way, you know, in the walks of life or how we see things. But nevertheless, our humanity is the commonality between us. Everybody's welcome. People from all walks of life have always consistently come to Qatar and they felt safe. This is a welcoming nation. Uh, and it is a welcoming tournament. And I'd like to tell everybody uh, that, have, that, that you know, uh, might have certain reservations, please, from now till 2022, we've got two Club World Cups we're hosting by the end of this year and by the end of next year. Please come and join us. And you'll see, you'll see what I'm talking about. It's on the ground. You know, the proof is on the ground. What do you, finally, final question, what do you want the legacy of the World Cup to be? Oof. You see, when you call, my, when you call the organization Supreme Committee for Delivery and Legacy, <laughs> it's not a simple answer. I can see they're saying, please wrap up in a moment. <laughs> I don't know if I can wrap up in a moment with that, but let me just put it simply as this. Look, we've always said it's, it's a unifying platform. For me, the measure of success would be in 2025, 2026, when you look at a family, when you look at you know, a young girl, a young boy, um, who has somehow benefited directly or indirectly from the World Cup. We've launched initiatives you know, using football for development like Generation Amazing. We've launched initiatives on worker welfare reforms, as I said, that actually has far-reaching impact beyond just the welfare of construction workers, but also how they can contribute to their families back home. So for me, the measure of success is finding individuals that have actually, that this tournament has bettered their lives one way or the other. Hassan, thank you very much. We wish you continued success. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you all. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage Eric Rostin, sustainability editor at Bloomberg and our esteemed panel. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to what is going to be a super interesting panel because I've been backstage having it for the last half hour. <laughs> um, we have here uh, Mats Granrid, who is the Director General of GSMA, uh, Stefan Richard, the Chairman and CEO of Orange, uh, Liz Yi, the Managing Director for Climate and Resilient Cities at the Rockefeller Foundation, and Marisa Drew. CEO of Imp the Impact Advisory and Finance Department at Credit Suisse. And we're here sort of at the intersection of two facts. One of them is a bummer, and one of them is pretty cool. <laughs> the bummer is there's about a 10% and rising chance that within the next century or two, most things will be destroyed. Um, the cool news, and if you go onto the GSMA website, you'll see this number. There are five billion mobile connections in the world. 
And the intersection of these two things is what we're talking about today. Uh, Mats, do you want to tee it up uh, and just talk a little bit about, uh, just really in the last two weeks, the initiatives the mobile industry has been making uh, and contributing to the, to the climate conversation? Sure. I mean, we, um, <clears throat> GSMA and, and our, all our mobile operators, uh, uh, as you rightly said, we connect 5.2 billion people. So that's two-thirds of the whole planet, which I think is a pretty awesome power. And uh, we were the first industry as a whole to commit to the 17 SDGs. And, and we did that because the, the mobile industry is a very purpose-driven industry where we believe that we are intelligently connecting everyone and everything to a better future. And that better future is best described through the SDGs. Uh, so we're focusing on inclusion, uh, gender equality, number five, but also number 13, climate action. And uh, recently, uh, we have a commitment from two thirds of that 5.2 billion, so four point some billion uh, connections, uh, and the mobile operators will disclose their carbon footprint. And that's the first step to get to net zero by the latest 2050. Many operators will do it before that. Uh, so it, it's, it's a conscious effort to really get down to zero. That's the first step. The second step is to make sure that we are enabling other industries to save carbon footprint as well, because I think we have this opportunity to actually help other industries. But we need to make sure that we are credible in arguing that. So therefore, we need to start with our own house first. Mm -hmm. Let's uh, stay on, uh, on mobile technology for a second before we open it up. Um, and talk, let's talk about tech. And there are some really cool things, some counterintuitive things um, that mobile infrastructure can do uh, to help problems far beyond uh, uh, mobile connections. Do, do in terms of, yeah, I mean, so, like I mean, air we, monitoring, you know, weather yeah, monitoring. No, so we, we have a lot of different uh, cool stuff, as you yeah. said. For instance, if you take, um, um, tuberculosis, which is the infectious disease that kills the most people uh, on the planet. Roughly 5,000 people are, 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 are being killed by tuberculosis every day, every single day. Now, Bharti, Airtel, Vodafone Idea, and Geo, uh, Reliance Geo in India are using uh, human movement patterns using the mobile phone. And we can now predict with some certainty where the next outbreak will happen. And therefore, we can set up treatment centers and information campaigns before it actually happens, huh. saving enormous amount of people's lives. We have multi-drug resistant malaria that Telenor is working with in Bangladesh. It's another one of those examples of, again, figuring out how people are moving from one place to another using the, the data from this. We have, as you said, the <clears throat> IoT solutions in, in Brazil, in Rio de Janeiro, where Telefonica is using IoT solutions to pre predict um, air pollution problems up to maybe up to two days before it actually happens. Hmm. And we can then again go out and warn people. So there's a lot of social engagement in this. And I, I can comment sure. on that as well, uh, sitting in the seat that I sit in, because um, we often are trying to create investment opportunities for both institutional investors and private clients to invest behind things that have positive social and environmental outcomes. And the mobile te telephony um, technology is unlocking so many opportunities across the SDGs. So I think about things like sustainable agriculture. You use the geostationary satellite technology that comes through the mobile phone to be very precise on how you can farm more sustainably. In the healthcare space, of course, we're seeing massive, massive change. A company I've just come across recently um, has a sensor that you put on your body, and this is both for um, uh, frontier markets, but also for the Western world in terms of managing longevity. The sensor technology going through your mobile phone allowing you with precision, with individualized care, uh, with what you eat in the moment to, to track your you know, spiking of your sugar levels and things like this so that you can, I mean, it just goes on and on and on. So I'm a big believer that the technology behind mobile telephony is going to unlock some pretty big solutions. This is a much bigger use and kind of data than was ever dreamed up when these devices were invented. Uh, who, who owns the data? How does it get shared? Like, it seems like a conversation people must be having. One of the... Sorry. 
Okay. Well, I, one of the things that the foundation is doing right now, which I think is really amazing, is is really thinking about how community health workers um, and the communities in rural areas are actually able to to be better served. Um, and so right now, and in, in actually in India, many communities don't have access to health care, and they it, it's one health care worker, one community health care worker for a thousand thousands of people in their community. What we're doing is actually working with the community health worker to use their mobile phone and telephony to actually understand where the where what needs these communities have, um, where, for example, mothers may be near giving birth, so that the actual the community health worker can actually direct their attention mm. across the thousands of, of patients that they need to see in a more directed way, so they can actually achieve the health outcomes um, and, and improve the health outcomes of those rural communities. But the data ownership, I mean, you yeah. all can comment, I'm sure, but but I think it varies by region. So you look at a place like China, which is using a lot of scan technology through mobile telephony, and in theory, that's probably owned by the state, that data, or at least and that's how it's being captured. In other parts of the world, you have to give your permission. And so I think you have to think about regionally how that can actually be utilized in an appropriate and positive way, hopefully. <laughs> no, I think that there are basically two, uh, uh, maybe, sorts of, uh, of uh, data and uses of data. Uh, the first is for a uh, uh, general, positive general purpose, like connected ag agriculture or healthcare, or I uh, uh, have the uh, example of the uh, Ebola uh, crisis in Africa that uh, Orange is operating uh, largely in Africa. We've been able to fight against, thanks to also our uh, mobile networks, of course. Th this kind of data uh, must be open to uh, NGOs, to, pub, to governments, and to uh, everyone that can really bring uh, the benefits of, the, of digitization to people. And then there is the, the privacy uh, issue, which honestly today is probably more a Western world uh, concern, uh, where it's, it's about uh, uh, protection of, uh, of privacy. Uh, and as you know, uh, in Europe, we. Uh, uh, now have a regulation, uh, GDPR, which is setting, I would say, a, a minimum level of, of uh, uh, um, protecting personal data, which is becoming uh, probably a worldwide standard, which, which is nice. Um, then, of course, there is technology behind, and as you know, a big part of the data that are generated by uses of mobile phones, they are going to uh, or they are going back to, uh, to the, the, the giants that uh, are uh, running the big platforms. So Facebook, Google, uh, Apple with uh, its own services and, and so on. So we are talking about regulation and protection of, uh, of privacy. One thing that's, that's sort of soft and fuzzy and a little bit new uh, is like climate change is a collective action problem, famously. And each sector represented here, finance, cities, um, and, uh, and mobile, are all, and you may miss this, experiencing their own little collective moment. Um, like the, the mobile industry has gotten together and, and, as you already said, is making plans for the next couple of years. We've seen over the last few years, like dozens of cities getting together, the central banks to some extent, and other large financial uh, sector players are all getting together. Like, are there lessons for people in other industries uh, about this, um, this collaboration that you're, you're seeing within your sectors? Well, I, I think scale is important. I think the time of doing trials, they, that's passed. We, we now need to uh, get scale, and, and scale is best done through uh, partnerships with others. And, and we, are, we just came from a round table, and one of the topics were how do we reach out to other industries? It's fine that the mobile industry is united, possibly, uh, but how do we make sure that we can enable other industries as well, or other cities? So I don't think that there's ever been a better time to, uh, to have a, a true private-public partnership, which has been a, a very old term, but I think that is critical now. Uh, and I think it's, so there's cross-industry, so business to business, but then this concept of business to government to exactly. uh, the philanthropic community as well, because we used to have a world where sort of philanthropy said, my job's here, and business said, my job's here. And I think really for the first time, we're seeing this willingness for people to talk 
to each other and try to create a common language, and then uh, I think you can solve problems at scale. Because each of us has a role to play, and if you bring it all together, then you know, the, the multiplier effect of that combination is huge. Mm -hmm. Uh, what is the most sort of emboldening thing uh, like you've seen from where you sit in the last, like literally you can say six hours at the rate of news this week, <laughs> but like the last year and, and like, and you can't talk about your own stuff. <laughs> your own stuff. Like what's the most in, in, ennobling, emboldening, hopeful thing you've seen? Well, I, well, I have to start then. I, I mean, it must be Greta, no? The, the, the Swedish <laughs> teenage girl, yeah, okay. which is absolutely phenomenal, I must say. You know, you, you, you can love her or hate her, but the message is quite clear, and it's, it's delivered in a very precise manner. So huge respect for that, and that is uh, literally within the six months, as you said. Mm -hmm. Maybe two things very quickly. First, my kids. Uh, my kids uh, are exerting on me a permanent pressure on uh, uh, related to climate emergency uh, issues. It comes from uh, uh, mineral water at home with straws, plastic, and other things. So I, I, think, I, I think it's a it's very important change also. And I think that we are now at a time when, when the, the coming generation uh, it, it thinks that it is the number one issue for, for the future. Mm. And <laughs> a second thing on a much more, let's say, technological side, uh, which is in Africa, uh, solar um, antennas that we are uh, running out now, uh, which is, I think, a right, the right way to combine uh, global climate uh, issues, because it's, of course, it's a renewable energy, and efficiency, since the power supply in Africa is very poor and not reliable for us and costly. And it it's just shows that you can be good for uh, climate change and also good for your operations and business. I, I think, I guess that's about the, the challenge of going third as opposed to first. I mean, I, I think the thing that's been most enthusiastic to me or I'm most excited about is this youth movement. And we were debating behind the scenes, what age are you meant to give your child a mobile phone? Um, it sounds like 11 was kind of the consensus. So my six-year-old is out of the mix. Like in, in Europe. Um, but, if I do yeah, said that the yeah. average in Europe is the 11. The average in Europe right? was 11. Um, and, I, and I think that thinking about how we can use telephony for good, uh, is really a critical part of this equation um, from both understanding we were uh, one of the things the foundation's really excited about is figuring out how to use catalytic capital uh, and help finance the climate adaptation and resilience projects that we need to do. The challenge has always been data and so trying to figure out the intersection between channeling the youth energy towards something that um, is actually going to make material change and impact the world. Oh, sorry. I thought that was going in and out. Um, and now so we'll, I, Liz will lead us in song. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, so I, thinking at how mobile telephony can empower the youth movement and they can actually channel those energies towards good. Also um, thinking about how we can work at the intersections of finance to give them the data and the modeling that they need to be able to create consensus around the different actors. I know those are things that haven't yet happened in the next six months, but I think that they are imperatives in order for us to hit, or to avoid um, the two degrees. And in my case, you said I'm not to, supposed to talk my own book, but it is the, um, the intersection of technology and finance that gets me excited because um, we have this, we call it the surplus of capital in the world, looking to direct for positive outcomes. And the, mo the technological um, enabling that we're seeing across industries, again, the mobile phone's only one of them, uh, allows that capital to sort of find those places and invest for financial return while doing good, which to me is a commercially viable way to get the capital where we need it to go. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I mentioned your, your own uh, uh, initiatives, uh, some we've seen in the, just the last two weeks. Um, We've, we're also seeing these cross-sector initiatives like uh, TCFD, if one of you wants to uh, explain what that is, um, and, and these other sectors just to try to get everybody in the economy to speak the same language. Uh, any thoughts on how that's going and, and how it might be sped up? So for those who don't know what TCFD is, it is a uh, Governor Mark 
Carney and, of the Bank of England and, and Michael Bloomberg got together to uh, really start an initiative to ask uh, corporates and asset managers to have a broader f a disclosure around climate. But it also is challenging everybody to go deep within their businesses and run scenario modeling on to one and a half, two, three degree, et cetera, and understand where the risks are. Um, that's a great initiative to try to harmonize um, data and disclosure. That's the good bit. The bad bit today is we do have a data problem. There's an inconsistency of data, and um, there's been discussion about do we make TCFD mandatory today? It's voluntary. But uh, for those of us who are in the financial services industry, we all got together and said we actually couldn't comply today if we wanted to because there isn't enough data uh, uh, consistency and quality and rigor around the data that we've got in order to be able to even understand deep within a complex organization like a bank or an insurance company, what are your exposures to green and brown? Superficially, you can do that, but if you start to go deep, deep, deep within your organization, if you're an insurance company, do you actually know at the very base level of the policies that you're insuring on a homeowner uh, basis if those houses are green. The insurance companies that we know would say, actually, I don't have that deep a data. But we'll get there with machine learning AI. It'll come, but we're just not there yet. Mm -hmm. What about, well, we're hearing obviously a lot about climate this week, uh, and also about these things called the SDGs, which we know how everyone loves acronyms in this space. Uh, it, how much do you think about the SDGs? And you, you've already said, bullish on number 13. Um, are these aspirational? Are these useful in business, the SDGs? Yes, yes, I think so. Uh, uh, then now I think what is important is for each industry, the capacity to, to organize, to commit, not to expect from United Nations, for, from politicians, from uh, such or such country, but just to, to, to figure out what we can do collectively in a maybe more efficient way. And the mobile, uh, mobile industry uh, within GSMA, which is a worldwide uh, organization with 750 uh, members, 30 million employees, 5.2 billion uh, customers. So it's, it's a great power. And with great power comes great responsibility. So what we have to do now is really to set as a, as a, a priority, as a, as a goal, global goal, to see what we can do uh, to, to uh, accelerate into climate change, uh, let's say, uh, management and, uh, and fight. And this is what we have decided to do. So uh, uh, GSMA and, and then each of, of course, the, the members of this organization are going to, to, to commit very strongly uh, to see what, what they have to do, what they can do for themselves, house in order, mm -hmm. and also for uh, uh, the environment for uh, our customers, for uh, enterprises, for uh, societies, for individuals, uh, from marketing to, to technology to new services, and of course, also a better management of our own uh, assets, networks that are energy con consumers, and we can do a lot. Hmm. I was just going to add, I think that I, I, I echo those comments because I think relying on national governments to take action on SDGs is, is, can be slow. And that's why I think for us, very much thinking about the power of local government, thinking about how they can execute against the SDGs is a critical part of action. And, and so one of the things that, uh, cities is part of, a key part of our portfolio because we feel like that is a place that can really stimulate action. And we saw, um, you know, we, we, we have been working with 100 cities around the globe to build what we call urban resilience. And that's resilience to all of the climate challenges, but also thinking about the human and social and economic sides of what actually makes a city continue to be a place that people want to come to and a people, place that people want to stay. And I think to, to think about how uh, technology as well as um, mobile technology in particular is critically important. Uh, one of the things that we were talking about earlier was the city of Wellington in New Zealand post earthquake they certainly had to they did the work post earthquake but they worked within their community to actually identify who were the most seismically vulnerable implement the emergency systems and management that they needed to because they knew that the next um, 
the next earthquake was not far away. And so as they're thinking about how do they fulfill the SDGs, how do they create a resilient community and city, they're taking those actions into their own hands to be able to, to create places and, and be protect the citizens that actually live there for now and into the future. Yeah, well, maybe I should just say on the SDGs, we, as I said, we were the first industry as a whole to commit to the 17 goals back in the very beginning of 2016. And ever since, <clears throat> during this week, we launched our SDG impact report, and we're going to launch that later on today. Uh, and I think it's a, it's a pretty fascinating story to see how, how we, the mobile industry, is influencing the SDGs. And we're not perfect, uh, but we are doing movements in the right direction. And, and you know, a couple of stats that, you know, for the past four years, we have managed to connect more than 400 million more people, mm -hmm. which is phenomenal. We have, uh, back to healthcare, as, as you spoke about, uh, there's roughly 1.4 billion people using the mobile device for a healthcare app of some sort. That's up 230 million year over year. 230 million. Education, 1.3 billion people are using the mobile device for education. And that is up 130 million year over year. So absolutely do we have an impact to make. And that's why Stefan said this huge responsibility um, and, and we're trying to shoulder that uh, and to, to spread the, um, the good technology as much as we can. If I can comment on the financial services point of view, um, for us the SDGs provided, they're not an investment framework, they were never designed to be, but what they did allow us to do is to identify what the biggest challenges uh, are in the world, categorize them in, an, in, in buckets that are familiar with people, that allow people to identify with them and, and get the, behind them, and then um, lastly, it allowed um, the academics and scientists to actually quantify the size of the challenge. And for financial services, you need to speak a common language if you want to mobilize capital, and you need to understand what you're solving for. And I think the SDGs provided that. Yeah. And I'd love to give you just one little story of the intersection between uh, an SDG and using mobile, since it's all about um, mobile on this panel. Um, we have an impact investment, so this is an investment for return, uh, that was uh, trying to solve a very specific issue, which is um, a very big problem in Indonesia, which is the education system. It is a country that's the, about the fourth largest population in the world, but has been ranking near, nearest to the bottom in the world rankings for education. And we came across two young entrepreneurs in their late 20s, very mission-driven entrepreneurs, um, that figured out a way to take the curriculum of the school system in Indonesia and put it on uh, a mobile device, super visual, very interesting, culturally relevant, connected with the population, for-profit business. These young guys are adding a million subscribers a month to their education platform. They are making a massive dent in a really, really big problem with this intersection of technology, mobile, and the SDGs. In, uh, in the short time we have left, uh, it's just like, what guidance do you have for all of us on on thinking about climate change, it's predicated on this uh, complicated science, but we're all people and we have jobs and we're citizens. Like, how do you make sense? Like, what is your climate thing? Like, why do you do this? You could be like bowlers or, you know, like, or, or you know, cooks. Like, why are you doing this? And why are you on this panel talking about climate stuff? Just a, just a word, in my view, uh, we have to consider climate action uh, as not only a necessity, but a real opportunity. And I'm, I'm pretty sure that the, the, the future growth, uh, the future business, um, will be around what we can do uh, for climate action. But let's collectively see this as a, an opportunity and, and, and not a nightmare or a constraint or something which is necessarily painful. Any other thoughts? Yeah, no, I, I think that this is a time for rethinking uh, the, the way that we do business and, and moving away from just focusing on profit, but also focusing on the, the planet and the people that I mentioned. Uh, that is just so needed. Uh, and I think the time is exactly what you said, Stefan, is, is, is now to do that. To me, it's existential for humanity. If we don't tackle this now, we're not going to be here. There will be no more panels. And uh, if I have a role to play in financial services by bringing capital to that problem, then you know, I've, I've done something good for the world. Good legacy to have. <laughs> I, I heard a staggering statistic the other day that said we're, we're using 1.7 Earths at now, 
and at the rate we're going, we're gonna be using four to five Earths by 2050. So echoing your point, I mean, Marisa's point is, if we don't do something now, our, our children that we're so excited about giving them a future, they won't have a future, and I think it's critical that we do something to, to give them the, the chances that we had. Thank you so much. I encourage everyone for more information to look up GSMA and Orange and the Rockefeller Foundation and Credit Suisse. Thank you so much. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage Joe Lubin, co-founder of Ethereum and founder of Consensus, and Kavita Prakash Mani, Global Conservation Director at the World Wildlife Fund. Kavita, hey. how are you? Good, thank you. Nice hey. to be here. Hi, everyone. So as lead conservationist at one of the world's largest environmental organizations, um, how, what, what sort of barriers are you seeing? How do you feel that we can drive um, change, innovation at scale? Thanks, Joe. I mean, let me start by saying that, of course, at WWF and as the Environmental Conservation Agenda, this is a big, exciting week. We're here at the Climate Summit. The UN is here. Many reports have come out, but all are pointing to the big gap that we have in solutions. We've had many years of commitments being made, but we're still seeing you know, forests are burning in the Amazon, in the Congo, in, in Sumatra, even Siberia. Species are dying. We've uh, had 60% loss of species in 50 years. Another million are you know, predicted to, to be we wiped them out with, with how our uh, own systems of production and consumption are going. Um, and we're also seeing a lot of uh, climate action and climate impact, whether it's hurricanes or droughts and things. So it's really at that tipping point right now where if we don't act, and if we don't take really concrete solutions, we will not be able to conserve our environment. And of course, we all, humanity depends on that environment. So if we have to get to the sustainable development goals, which is what we're all bought into, we see that there's a gap of about $2.5 trillion in investment into the solutions to get to those goals. So we have a big gap and a big job to do, and we need all the kind of innovation, new thinking, new ideas, rather than all the traditional ways of working that we have done being really on the ground working with these communities. So, so is that the gap? Is it the money that's the gap? Or it's um, the money are, are there that's other the, mechanisms well, that I think, we need in place? And thank you for asking the question, because I think the money exists, but it's harnessing that money, but also harnessing the ideas so I think where we are finding the gap is that there's a number of ideas that are coming up from the bottom up, whether it's individuals or it's millennials or it's organizations or even like organizations like ours, and we know the money exists, but how do we match that? And that's where we need to work so, with so people saying, like yourself. Uh, so there was gonna... some mechanism, a <laughs> yes. platform even. Um... Turn it back to you to tell us what technology can actually do to help us in this space. Well, we, uh, we work in a field called blockchain, um, so we should probably start there. Um, blockchain, um, at its simplest, is a, a next generation database technology. Um, and the impacts of this next generation technology are potentially uh, profound. Um, 
We uh, have built technology upon which uh, the Ethereum platform, the Bitcoin platform, and many other platforms are predicated. Uh, and essentially, this technology represents a revolution in uh, what we call the trust infrastructure of the planet. And so uh, we can build blockchain systems for a small set of actors, and they benefit from uh, increased trust levels in collaboration. Or we can build blockchain systems that are maximally decentralized, that can operate on global scale. Uh, and if you build these systems so that they're maximally decentralized, you have uh, replicated systems run by thousands and thousands of people, independent people, um, you can build an infrastructure that can move the world from what we call subjective trust foundations, where we depend on individuals or, or centralized organizations, uh, to automated and objective trust. And so um, that's the principle that we're all excited about, uh, building a new trust foundation for the planet, building a settlement layer for different kinds of instruments on the planet. Um, and once you have a trust foundation in place, then you can do some really interesting things. You can create uh, digital scarcity. Uh, so that's where you get cryptocurrencies from. That's where you get um, different kinds of financial instruments that are guaranteed to be digitally scarce. Uh, that's where you get tokens that can represent real estate or, or other kinds of goods. Um, and even more exciting, um, once you have systems that can embody rules by which uh, groups want to cooperate, uh, you can have trustful collaboration. So uh, collaboration at unprecedented scales with unprecedent, unprecedented ease. And so uh, we look forward to, as the technology gets built out, we look forward to a world in which the, uh, the competition characteristic uh, is maybe uh, shrinks or, or is maybe even dwarfed by the collaboration characteristic of, of how we work together. Which is amazing because I think collaboration for us and, and the ability of these technologies to bring the different players together is very powerful. And I think everyone must be wondering about how do we actually use yes, as we, WWF. We've been collaborating. <laughs> what, what you might be doing. And we've been collaborating on that. And just to build off of that, where we see one of the biggest uh, gaps that we have right now is linking uh, specifically value chains. So if you look at it from a conservation or a development perspective, we have all of these producers around the world that might be producing our coffee or our cocoa or, or even palm oil or other commodities that we use, or fish, which fish. is a big one. Sustainable uh, tuna. Sustain but you know, do we know they're sustainable? How do we know that they were produced in a manner that didn't cut down the rainforest or didn't have conversion or paid fair wages or were human rights? And I think we find a lot of benefit from having blockchain kind of, uh, kind of technologies to help capture that data and keep it integral to the end so that we all, as consumers, can actually trace it back and be confident about what we are buying and that we are protecting uh, the environment and contributing to the SDGs. But we also see a lot of, you know. Should we drill down on that project uh, yeah. briefly? So, so that's a project uh, that involves, say, a supply chain and tracking the provenance of food, uh, of, yes. in this case, sustainable tuna. Um, the beauty of blockchain is that once you get data in the system, it remains trustworthy uh, along the entire value chain with many different actors with different agendas, all being part of the same IT infrastructure, essentially. And so uh, we collaborated on building a system that tracks how fish are caught, that tracks how fish are landed, and tracks the paperwork. Um, in later iterations of the system, it can track the temperature at which um, it is transported in trucks and transported in airplanes. And uh, we built an app, uh, a mobile application that uh, enables people to um, very soon uh, essentially scan the label of tuna um, on the store shelf or, or in the case uh, and determine exactly um, where it was caught, um, that it was caught by a sustainable certified uh, fisher person, um, and uh, the conditions under, under which it... Uh, and you have this wonderful uses. map that you yeah. can trace about it's exactly where it went, so you know, exactly where the fish was and where, where the ship was. But we're now collaborating on bigger things than that as well, and going back to the original thing of saying, 
we are seeing this big gap in the ability to match some of the ideas that are coming up in terms of the innovation with the, uh, with the funding. Yeah. And it's been done very often, and of course, we find that impact investing and everyone does it, but it's not really built on these kind of technologies uh, that we might have. So again, you know, we have a number of uh, innovators and in, uh, that, are, that come to us with ideas such as, um, can we use you know, energy of the grid where we're sharing it between homes and, and cities? Can we use uh, renewable sources for, say, production of food or baskets or roads and everything else? And they sometimes need very little sums of money and sometimes need a lot, and they need a lot of help. Yeah. So we're excited to be working with you on this new idea, and it'd be great if you could talk us through Impact. Yeah, so in our early discussions uh, a, a little more than two years ago, um, it was clear that... Uh, uh, the w WWF uh, wanted to move from um, overseeing charitable giving to uh, also adding uh, impact investing. Um, there is a lot of money out there. There are a lot of needs out there. Uh, this project specifically focuses on the SDGs. Um, and uh, we have been pioneering on the blockchain platform. We've been pioneering decentralized governance and we've been pioneering mechanisms for uh, essentially curating things that, that people care about. And so um, this sort of platform enables us to bring subject matter experts uh, into collaboration uh, with um, entities that have assets that, that they want to deploy mm -hmm. uh, on certain projects and, and many entities that have uh, worthy projects. Uh, these projects uh, essentially need to be scrutinized. They need to be uh, prepared uh, by some of the subject matter experts, and uh, they need to be prioritized. Uh, and so uh, we built something that's a little technical. It's called a token curated registry that enables these experts to not only um, stake uh, some part of either value or part of their reputation, um, in the form of a token, uh, but also uh, get behind these projects and uh, shape them so that they are uh, really worthy uh, for investment and understandable by the people who are interested in investing. Uh, so, so if it, we get the ideas of these brilliant new innovations, exactly. then you will find experts who will then review them, but also put their money where their mouth is and put tokens yeah. to back it. Absolutely. So that when you actually finalize it, you have something that has been tested. So it's not just my friends going and voting for their favorite or my favorite yeah. uh, project online. Yeah, in some cases, they're putting their money or their reputation where their mouth is. In other cases, uh, for impact investing, you can actually uh, earn some sweat equity. Uh, right. by So you, you stake your token. And if this project is selected and funded, then uh, maybe you get a, a small slice of the equity as well. And so the beauty of a, a platform like this is um, it has transparent governance, uh, so everybody knows who is configuring this project and why uh, the rules by which it operates are also transparent. The tokenization enables us to um, do really interesting things like uh, um, you know, staking, uh, but also tracking source of funds and tracking usage of funds. Yep which is incredibly important uh, from, from some of our, our early So the discussions. transparency of where money goes and how it impacts. Exactly, and can we exactly also track, how it's used can be tracked. Yeah. And can we track same. impact as well? Can we then measure what the outcomes of these, um, these investments would be? Sounds like a next phase to the project. <laughs> should, should we workshop that? Because I think we all want to know that, right? We want to know, find the money went there, but did yeah. it actually have the impact? And that might be something that we can build on together so we can, we, should. we can see how the SDGs are. Should we do that right? in the New York office or, in, or sure. in the Sydney office? Well, there you go. That's the new partnership that's just getting defined here. I think we should do it here That'd be great. so we can work on it together. But I think what is also, what, what I would love for us to think about, and you know, it's, it's be great to hear from, if we had a chance to have heard from the audience, uh, is to say what are the bigger solutions that we can create that might use some of these technologies? Because right now, what we can do is have smaller ideas, but they need to be built up and they need to be scaled up. Yeah. And so I'm almost seeing that platform as something that people can come to and you can, you know, we invite you all to definitely sign up and be part of that community because you're the experts 
you can bring in the kind of uh, ideas, but also help sharpen these and make them stronger so they have the impact uh, that we want, whether it's energy systems or fisheries or you know, sustainable infrastructure or sustainable food, sustainable diets, getting to consumers. So we need you to be part of that community, but we also need those scaled up. So maybe that will trigger a broader widening and a scaling up of some of these efforts uh, that we have there. Absolutely. So we've run two pilots. One was an internal pilot and the other was uh, external. I think we had over 50 subject matter experts, uh, 34 projects, of which 17 of them were curated uh, and uh, essentially one representation on the platform. Um, uh, these projects range from um, kelp-based packaging for, for foodstuffs to sharing of, uh, of photovoltaics so that uh, uh, both tenants and landlords can, can share electricity uh, to bounties that uh, uh, enabled um, um, reduction in ocean plastic and taking ocean plastic and, and making uh, things like baskets and chairs, et cetera. So these are uh, they're cool projects. Each of them mapped to about three or four uh, SDGs. And uh, the first pilot, or, or the, the real pilot, uh, was very successful. And we're hoping to do something bigger. And it's up and running. And we're inviting people to put in their ideas and help us curate this and make these stronger and get some investment cool. to deliver the SDGs. Sounds great. Thank you very much. Thank you.